Hi, Bala. How are you? Hi. Good. How are you? Good. Good. Hi, Ashok. Hi. How are you? Fine. So, how's Bangalore? Well, Bangalore is fine. I mean, <laughs> I'm I'm still mostly inside the house, a flat. Haven't gone okay, to the office okay. very much, but I once in a while I go. Why? The office is air conditioned or is it? <laughs> office? No, no. There's no air conditioning needed here. Ah, so then it's COVID healthy. Yeah, yeah, it's COVID healthy. That's not a problem. Is there any Nelaba that I got got used to staying inside all the time? So that. Oh, because it's hot. Hot. No, no, because of COVID. Oh, because of COVID. Okay, okay. I'm okay. now slowly yeah. coming out of it, but it's still. It's, uh, no, no, this Omicron is coming, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Back to that. <laughs> so it's probably a good idea to keep that habit. Yeah. Sorry, my video is off. I can see that. Yeah. So Sumati is also. Yeah. Is now. Yeah, but she joined <laughs> in August. Okay. So she joined Mar before me. I came only to about three weeks ago. Oh, okay. So how are things in Horki? Uh, so uh, people, uh, I think it was uh, even as early as late last year, most certainly uh, uh, this year that they refused to acknowledge that there is something called COVID. So, <laughs> so it's just a figment of one's imagination. And uh, therefore, timid people like me uh, have been uh, campus confined for two years. <laughs> Just venture out for running some errands. <laughs> but I guess in the campus, they're all... Yeah, yeah, campus is good. Yeah, but unfortunately, actually, this, uh, this so-called second wave, I mean, that that hit the campus very bad. Uh, uh, uh -huh. It was horrible. I mean, uh, it was like whole week... Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. Amusingly, hostels here are called bhavans. And uh, yeah. incoming faculty members live in hostels. So it's... Interesting. So we had whole bhavans worth of uh, COVID uh, positive students. And oh. uh, it was scary. I mean, it was really scary. And then like on a two day notice, students had to be vacated. So the Institute had an amazing, did an amazing job of ranging road tra transport from the campus even all the way to Bhopal, in central oh. India. Yeah. But it was war front. I mean, it was, uh, yeah, it was really, I mean, I was scared. I, I, I mean, I openly admit, I was really scared. Uh, that it was spreading in the campus. But, uh, post this drastic measure, it became okay. Now it seems to be uh, quite all right. But, uh, so how's it in Chennai, especially math science? I mean, are people mindful of? Uh... Yeah, math science are fairly careful. Chennai, yeah, well, about thirty percent of the people are masked. Oh. I guess it also depends on the locality. I mean, in our area, I see a lot of people masked. But if you go to the you know shopping areas and all that, they're not very careful. But for some reason, the number of cases in Tamil Nadu is not that high. I don't know whether that's because they don't report it or okay. it's not there. But people are probably something to be said about herd immunity kicking in eventually, finally. So yes, I mean, yeah, that's most, probably most true. people have double shots now. So. Yes, yes. I think uh, uh, we can probably start now, Anirban. Is that because it is 9.33 now? I suppose it's a good time. Or would you like to wait? I mean, it's up to you, entirely up to you, Anirban. Uh, Anirban, can you hear me? Yeah. So should we begin? Yeah, I, I was asking you the same question. I mean, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's 9.34. Yeah, so we, we could begin. Maybe, yeah. All right. Great. Thanks. Okay, so welcome to the morning session. So first speaker is Ashok Sen. He will tell us about the Dean's Intent on Corrections to String Perturbations. 
share my screen. Uh, is it visible? Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for organizing this conference and inviting me to this uh, to speak. So this is the title of my talk, the instant on amplitudes in string theory. Okay. So let me begin by giving a brief introduction to what the instant tons are. Okay. And the short answer is that the instant tons are to D-brains, what ordinary instant tons are to solitons in quantum field theory. Okay. Technically, what you do in the instant on that is that you use Dirichlet boundary condition on open strings along all non-compact directions, including time, and also possibly some compact directions. Okay, here you can either use Dirichlet or Norman. Okay. And physically, they represent finite action classical solutions in string theory. Okay. And because of this, they generate non-perturbative con contribution to string amplitudes of order e to the minus c over gs, where c is typically a constant and gs is the string top. Okay, so this is the dean certain action. Now, why are they important? Okay, they are expected to play important role in many aspects of string phenomenology. Okay, so for example, they provide uh, contribution to the super potential that is needed for modular stabilization, okay, both in the KKLT and the large volume scenario. Okay. And in many cases, one finds that a perturbative contribution to Yukawa type couplings on the brain vanish, and D instantons provide the leading contribution. So, because the instantons are described by Dirichlet boundary condition on open strings, their contribution to the amplitude can, in principle, be computed systematically using perturbative wall sheet methods. And the general structure is that we have a factor of e to the minus c over gs. This is the de instanton action, and then it's given by sum over wall sheets, which include those with boundaries. So, this is really a theory of open strings on the de instanton and closed strings. But the problem that one faces in implementing this is that open strings on D instantons carry zero momentum along the non-compact directions. And so the usual technique of analytic continuation and momenta that is used to get finite amplitudes in string theory no longer works. And for this, we need to use string field theory to extract sensible answers. Okay, and this is what I'll try to explain in the rest of the talk. So let me just say that string field theory techniques so far have been applied to three classes of examples where the answer is known from a dual description. So the first class of examples is two-dimensional bosonic string theory. Okay, this was initiated by these authors, Balthas and Rodriguez and In. And here the result is known from dual matrix model calculation. Okay, in particular, the specific answer that uh, these people used for the comparison is by Moore, Pleasant, and Ramgulam in the early 90s. The second example is Dean Centron contribution to type to be string theory amplitudes in 10 dimensions. Okay. And here the, res um, the result is known again from S duality and supersymmetry. Okay. This again is goes back to the late 90s, okay, the work of Greenwood, Perle, and Green and Sethi. And finally, it has been applied to Dean Centron contribution to type 3 or type to be string theory on Talabi or three folds. Okay. <laughs> here the results are known, but it's more recent. Okay, it, it, it was achieved during the last 10 years. Okay. And basically, it requires clever use of mirror symmetry, S duality, and supersymmetry to figure out what this contribution should be. Okay. And the string field theory technique works in all these cases. Okay. And for this reason, one hopes that it can be trusted for the cases where the answer is not known. Okay. And some of these I'll describe, one of these I'll describe at the very end. Okay, just mentioned. So let me begin with the general structure. So since the amplitude is proportional to gs to the minus chi, okay, where chi is the other number of the world sheet, okay, this is true in, even in normal perturbative string theory. Okay. So the leading contribution in a given instant on sector will come from world sheets with maximum chi. Okay. And here is the world sheet with maximum chi. Okay. So first of all, the annulus has chi equal to zero. So you can put in as many factors of the annulus as you want without costing a factor of this string. So it's exponential. So you have the exponential of the annulus. And then you have product of these one particles. Okay, because the more disks you can use, the more parts of one over G string you will get. Now, 
due to decrease the boundary condition on the at the boundaries the individual wall sheet amplitudes do not conserve energy at all and in fact this is the reason we include disconnected wall sheet because in normal string perturbation theory you only use connected wall sheet because each wall sheet component has its separate energy momentum conservation that is not the case here so the disconnected wall sheet is as important as connected wall sheet okay all that matters is how many powers of uh, inverse powers of g string you can get So at this order, okay, the leading order in the G-string expansion in a given instant on sector, okay, all the subtleties are in this exponential of the annular amplitude. Okay, and this is what I'm in, I'm going to describe in this talk. Okay, the higher order corrections can also be dealt with using string field theory, but I'll not discuss that here. Okay, so physically, the exponential of the annular amplitude is the one-loop determinant of fluctuations of string fields around the instant on. So here is the general structure of the annular amplitude. Okay, this is the standard wall sheet uh, result. Okay. So it has this structure. We have an integral, okay, which is basically the modulus of the annulus. Okay, the ratio of the two uh, uh, directions, the two circles, okay. and then you have a trace over all the open string states, okay, weighted by this factor, e to the minus two pi a, uh, t l zero. Where L zero is the zero mode of the Villazoro generator and minus one to the f, this is one for space-time bosons and minus one for space-time fermions. And to take into account the fact that the ghosts have zero modes, this trace is to be performed over only those states which are annihilated by B zero. Now I should just say that this minus one to the f, even in bosonic string theory, okay, we have to uh, take into account this minus one to the f because even bosonic string theory has ghost states. Okay, and the ghosts are, as you know, are are just one out typically. Now this has potential divergence from the t equal to zero end and t equal to infinity end. But one can show that if you have a consistent string theory that has no closed string tachyons, then there are no divergences from the t equal to zero end. Okay, t equal to zero end, in fact, is the closed string exchange between the d instantons. So we can basically define this integral. By putting a small cutoff and taking a couple of cutoff to zero. So with this, we can now, or in the, with this knowledge, we can now evaluate this explicitly. Okay. And here is the answer that one gets. Okay. Here I have assumed that H B and H F are positive. Okay, and then this is just an identity. Okay, one can easily show that this is nothing but this. So exponential of the A will be given by just ratios of the fermionic. L zero eigenvalue divided by the bosonic L zero eigenvalue of this form, and this will come back to uh, several times. Okay, so here is the expression for the exponential of a that I showed you, okay. and as I said, this formula is valid for positive H B and H F. Okay, that is an identity. If you have negative H B, okay, then this you can see diverges from the t equal to infinity end. Okay. But the right hand side is well defined. Okay. So while this is ill defined, we can still use the right hand side to define this, and this amounts to analytic quantification. Okay. In terms of instantons, this basically means that the instanton is a saddle point, so it has a tachyonic direction, and this analytic continuation amounts to doing the integration over the fluctuations along the steepest descent contour. Okay, so for example, you integrate along the imaginary axis instead of the real axis if you have a tachyonic field. The problematic cases are when H B or H F vanishes. Okay, because you can see that it has the form zero by zero, okay? and in this integral, it shows up as divergences from the t equal to infinity end. Okay? And these are the these are the cases that you have to deal with carefully. So the remedy that we will be following is that we will regard this as path integral over open string fields, and then try to make sense of the integral. Now, these open string fields is a big word here because open string fields really zero, live in zero space-time dimensions. That means they are just ordinary variables, okay? Often the infinite number of variables, but just ordinary variables, and that's because you have to reduce the boundary condition on all the non-compact directions. Okay, so there is a continuous momentum that levels these open string fields. So we are going to illustrate this procedure with the example of a single instant on amplitude in type two on Calabria band. This is the work with uh, Sergei Alexandrov and Bogdan Stefanski, 
but the same procedure works also in the other cases that I mentioned. Now, in this theory, type 2 on Calabria, the only supersymmetric in, uh, instant turns, if you take type 2 SP string theory particularly, the only supersymmetric instant turns are Euclidean D2 brains wrapped on three cycles of Calabria threefold. Now, here I should remind you that D2 brain, okay, by definition, has a three dimensional world. Okay, that's why it can wrap a three cycle on Calabria threefold. It, in fact, wraps a, wraps a Lagrangian three cycle. And to compute this, okay, for computing any amplitude, okay, induced by this D2 brain on three dimensional uh, on Calabria threefold, we have to first compute this exponential of the annulus. Okay, this is annulus zero point function. Okay, so here is the expression for the annulus amplitude. Okay, it gets contribution from the Nebuchadnezzar sector and the Ramon sector. Okay. Now it turns out that if you have D2 brains on supersymmetric three cycles, then these two factors just cancel. Okay, FNS of T is in fact equal to FR of T. And this is a consequence of supersymmetry. Okay. Now this seems very simple. So you can just set A equal to zero and then E to the A is one. Okay. But we have to be careful because in this cancellation, there are also contribution from L0 equal to zero states. Okay. So the L0 equal to zero states represent constant contribution to FNS and constant contribution to FR. Okay. They are equal, so they cancel. In fact, in this case, it's precisely two minus two. Okay. But as we saw for the constant contribution, okay, when you try to think of this as the ratio of this HB and HF, we have the form zero by zero. Okay. So you shouldn't really trust this cancellation for L0 equal to zero states, and we have to deal with it using open string field theory. So this is what I've said that for HB equal to zero and HF equal to zero, we cannot trust this. But for positive HB and HF, we can trust this cancellation. So you can just forget about all the positive HB and HF uh, states. Okay. Now, this is not necessary, this step. Okay. But for the ease of keeping track of various factors, what we'll do is that we'll deform the system by putting slightly shifted boundary condition on the two boundaries of the annulus. Okay. So typically, you have a D, if you have a D instant on, then both boundaries on the annulus, you have to put the D instant on boundary condition Okay, which fixes the positions of the uh, uh, instant on in uh, space time. Okay. So we'll pretend as if we have slightly shifted boundary condition on the two boundaries of the in, in, uh, annulus, so that if one boundary corresponds to some particular space time point, the other boundary will correspond to a slightly shifted space time point. Okay. And the effect of this is that it will add a small constant h to the L0 eigenvalues. Okay. And this preserves conformal and BRST invariant on the wall sheet, so you don't break any uh, symmetry. Okay. So what we will do is that we will pretend that this small, small constant has been added, okay. and then see what is the problem that we face when we try to set this constant to zero, because that's what we are interested in. Okay, so if we deform it this way, okay, then the relevant part of the annulus is here. Okay. I said it was two minus two, and now because we have added a small constant. To L0 is 2 e to the minus 2 pi th minus 2 e to the uh, minus 2 e to the 2 pi th. So it's still 0, of course. Okay. But we'll now write this as 4 minus 2 minus 2. Okay, and that's because this is the way this contribution actually arises when you do string field theory. Okay. But at this stage, it's just an identity. Okay. Now, here, because all of these are positive. Okay, you can manipulate it further using the formula that I showed you. So it's given by square root of product of two h squares. So that this minus two here and h to the four. Okay. And now this step is also an identity, but it's a somewhat non-trivial step. So I'll now represent this, this ratio as an integral. Okay. So it, this integral represents integral over four bosonic variables, psi mu, okay, with this weight factor. And this integral, okay, the psi mu integral, you can easily convince yourself, gives you this one over square root of h to the four. That's how this normalization has been fixed. P and Q are just one odd variables. Okay, the PQ integral you can convince yourself gives you just h. That's square root of h square. And chi alpha are also just one odd variables. Okay, G alpha is a matrix with squares to h times the identity. Okay. So when you do this integral, okay, you basically get another factor of square root of h square. Okay, so this is still an identity. 
Okay. Except that now, once you have written this as an identity, we can figure out what this corresponds to in the language of string field theory. And what we'll see is that the Xi mu's will correspond to the four Grassmann even modes that are related to Dean's central position. PQ are two Grassmann odd modes that represent ghosts okay, in string field theory. This is a gauge fixed version of the path integral. And chi alpha are four Grassmann odd modes that represent Fermion zero modes. Okay, that's the way this will be interpreted in the language of string field theory, although it's nothing but what we started with. Okay, nothing has been done. This is, it started with A equal to one and it's still one. Okay. So let me summarize what we'll find and then I'll illustrate how this happens. Okay. So what we'll find is that this E to the A expression that I have written down, this can be interpreted as the Siegel gauge fixed path integral of open string field theory on the instanton. In this interpretation, the modes P and Q will represent for their proper posts. Okay. And this automatically implies that the Siegel gauge becomes singular in the A equals to zero. Okay. Because you see, if P and Q are ghosts, Right, then H equal to zero means that the ghost kinetic term is vanishing. Okay. And the ghost kinetic term vanishing is a sure signal that your gauge choice is breaking down. Okay. So the remedy that will follow is that we will work with the original gauge invariant path integral before gauge fixing okay, and try to evaluate this. And we'll see that this is possible in this case. Okay. And what it will do is that it will get rid of the zero modes P and Q from the integral. Because in the gauge invariant form, there'll be no ghosts. Okay. So here is the gauge invariant path integral. Okay. So this I'll not explain how it comes. Okay. When you do open string field theory and integrate out all the massive modes, okay, the massless modes give you this integral. S is the open string field theory action, which I've written down. You can evaluate this explicitly in terms of open string fields, and this is what you get. Now you recognize that they have still have the integrals over the xi mu and chi alpha, okay? but you have a new integral over this variable phi. So what is phi? Okay? So phi is a new variable that comes in open string field theory. Okay? And this phi is what is gauge fixed to zero in the single gauge. Okay? So because it's a gauge invariant path integral, you have this integral over phi, and then you have to divide by the volume of the gauge group, which is the integral over theta. Okay? So theta is the like open string gauge transformation product. So this is what I have said here. And now I can also write down the gauge transformation laws. Okay, so delta phi is h times theta and delta psi three is square root of h times h to what two times theta. Okay. You can easily convince yourself that this is a symmetry of this action. Okay, so it's perfectly fine. You have a gauge invariant action. Now you see that- Yes, go ahead, please. So uh, have you integrated out the p's and the q's? Yeah, so this is before you come, before even P's and Q's are integrated, right? Uh, are obtained. This is gauge invariant path integral. This is a starting point. Okay. I'll now explain how the P's and Q's come from here. Okay. Okay, so before I explain that, let me just say that the three direction here is special okay, because you have taken the shifted boundary condition between the two boundaries to be along the three direction. Okay, so I said that I displace the two boundary boundaries, I just uh, chosen to displace it along the third direction. Okay, that's why I3 is based. Now, as I said, Siegel gauge corresponds to setting phi equal to zero. That's certainly possible here, okay, for non-zero H. And you can see that when you set phi equal to zero, okay, there's a Jacobian that comes in because you have to change variable from phi to theta, that's H. Okay. Okay. And as in Fadia Popov mechanism, this determinant, Okay, the H, we have to represent as integral over the ghosts. Okay. And that's where the P and Q comes in. Okay, so this factor of H that you get from the Jacobian, you re-express as exponents uh, yeah, integral over P and Q weighted by to the minus H. Okay. That's the way we arrive at the previous formula that I wrote down. But now you see that if H is zero, okay, then clearly this is not sensible because phi doesn't transform under gauge transforms. So you cannot use the theta gauge transformation to set phi equal to zero. So the remedy that we'll be following is to forget about Siegel gauge and work with this and set h equal to zero there and see what we get. So this is what I've said. So for h equal, if we just say, take the integral that I wrote down, the gauge invariant form and set h equal to zero, you get this integral. 
And now you see this also shows that it is not sensible to say use Siegel gauge to see phi equal to zero because phi explicitly appears in the action. So you do the phi integral. This is just a Gaussian integral. Okay, and this is what we are able. So now you have to understand how to do these integrals over psi mu and chi alpha. So psi mu, that is, as I said, they are related to the location of the instanton, which I'll call x, x mu. But to actually do these integrals, you have to know the precise relation between psi mu and x mu. And the way we find this precise relation is that we look at the world sheet result for the coupling of psi mu to a string amplitude. This just involves the xi mu vortex of quarter and insert it on a wall sheet, on the wall sheet. Okay, that's the open string vortex operator. And then you compare it with, with what we expect of coupling of x mu. Okay, if x mu is really the instant on position, then uh, x mu dependence will be just e to the i p dot x, where p is the total momentum carried by all the closed strings. Okay. As I said, open strings don't carry any momentum. So x dependence is given by this. So by comparing these two, we can actually figure out the relationship between xi mu and x mu. Similarly, the gauge transformation parameter theta, that is the open string gauge transformation parameter, that is related to the u1 gauge transformation that you are familiar with on the d insert one or on any d brain. Okay. So this alpha parameter is basically telling you that a, an open string whose one end lies on the d insert one okay, picks up a phase away to the i alpha. That's the definition of what you mean by this u1. And again, by comparing the, the string field theory gauge transformation laws with this U1 gauge transformation, where we just is a phase up into the I alpha, we can figure out the relationship between theta and alpha. So here is the result. I'll not explain how this comes, but as I said, these are straightforward wall sheet calculation. Okay. So xi mu is given by this, where GO is an open string coupling. Okay. And this has a precise relation to the tensor of the, uh, to the action of the instant, okay, which is TR. Okay. So this is basically the volume of the, the D2 brain that tracks the Calabio three, uh, the three cycle of the Calabio divided by the string top. I have another question. Yes. Uh, so xi mu, wasn't xi mu a uh, fermionic parameter? No, no, xi mu or bosonic. The chi was not. Okay, it's so I thought the, the xi mu's, the integral over the xi mu's gave, gave the h square in the numerator, right? No, denominator. It's given the 1 over h to the 4. Okay, okay, fine. Thanks. Okay, so after you use that, I should have said this. So, geo is given in terms of this uh, instant on action. Okay, so then integral over xi mu, you can rewrite as integral over x mu. And the integral over theta, I can write as an integral over alpha. Okay. And then I simply use the fact that alpha has period 2 pi to write this as a 4 pi over g. Okay. So I just substitute all this in this integral, and this is what we get. Okay. So now we have an interpretation of x mu and chi alpha as the collective modes. Okay. So x mu is the instant on position, and chi alpha, these four chi alphas are the collective modes of the instant on because it breaks four out of eight supersymmetries. Okay, so there are four one zero modes. Okay. So these have to be done at the end of the computation. Okay, just like in all collective modes in, um, in uh, of instantons in string theory, in uh, quantum field theory, okay, these instanton, these integrals have to be done at the end. Okay. So the XMU integral will eventually give that momentum conserving delta function, right, which was missing from the beginning, but it comes at the end after you do the XMU integral. And because chi alpha the Grassmann odd, okay, the integration over the Grassmann odd variables will vanish unless there are four insertions of chi alpha in the rest of the amplitude. Okay. So basically, this says that whatever amplitude you are computing, okay, you have to insert four chi alphas that are addition in addition to whatever um, external states you had. Okay. Then the chi alpha integral will generate this factor of um, the antisymmetric tensor epsilon, four index antisymmetric tensor, contracted with the amplitude with the chi alpha insertions. Okay, here I've said the disk amplitude because I'm looking at the leading order, but this is true in general. Okay, so this is the procedure. Now let me say how to compare with what you know. Okay, the predictions. Okay. So for this, let's go back to type two and Calabria three four. Okay, it has two kinds of order life fields, vector multiplied and hypermultiplied. 
And supersymmetry implies that the moduli space factorizes into the product of extramultiplet moduli space and the hypermultiplet moduli space. Now it turns out that the metric on the vector multiplet model space that is computed at the tree level is exact. Okay? Because the string coupling is in the hypermultiplet. Okay? And because these two decouple, the hypermultiplet fields cannot enter the vector multiplet uh, metric. Okay? So this is exact, but the metric on the, the hypermultiplet model space that uh, does receive perturbative and instant corrections. Okay? So the, it's this corrections to image that we are after. Okay. And as I said already, that the corrections to image due to D instant turns, these have been predicted by combining inputs from supersymmetry, mirror symmetry, and S12. Okay. And the question is, these predictions based on the symmetries, okay, does this agree with the direct computation that I described, direct computation of the overall normalization, and then the product of these characteristics? Okay. So let me say what it involves. Okay. So the hypermultiplet modular space metric, I have written here this way. Okay, GHMN is a modular space metric. Okay. So this has to be translated to the action. Okay, so this into induces a scalar field action okay, in uh, four space-time dimensions, which is well, this is the Lagrangian density. You have to integrate it over the four space-time dimensions to get the action. Okay. And it turns out that this prediction for the instant correction to GH. Okay, can be from a particular D, uh, Euclidean D-brain, okay, particular instant on. So here I have said a wrap Euclidean D-brain on a cycle gamma. So gamma is some free cycle that the D-brain wraps. Okay. So this is a general structure that one finds from these predictions that I talked about. So this A gamma M okay, can be predicted explicitly from the analysis of the s duality mirror symmetry and supersymmetry. And our goal will be to compare this with what we get from explicit computation. So the first question is what amplitude should we compare? Okay. This is the correction to the metric, but this is not what we compute in string theory. String theory tells you how to calculate S matrix. Okay. So this is the goal. Okay. So the first effect of these corrections actually appear in the four phi scattering amplitude. Okay. Because two and three point function vanish on shells. Scalar massless scalars don't have on shell two and three point function, even for complex external momentum. Okay. So this is a relevant diagram. Okay. Fortunately, by manipulating the expression, one finds that after the normalization determined by the C to the A by two that he already computed, okay. this A gamma M is actually given by the disk amplitude with one phi M and two open strings zero modulus charges. Okay. So even though we started with this four point function, Okay. The final computation of A gamma M can be reduced to just a disk amplitude, a single disk amplitude with one insertion of closed strings and two insertions of open strings in a mode, the chi okay. So the way we do this computation is that you work in the large volume limit of Calabria. Okay. And this, in fact, is exact in type 2 string theory because size modulus is in the vector multiplet and hence it cannot affect the metric on the hypermultiplet. So for the actual computation, we pretend that the DP brain is locally flat because it's a large volume. Okay. Once you have assumed, once you have taken a locally flat DP brain, we can simply evaluate the contribution to the amplitude from a local patch of the D brain using the standard worksheet method and then integrate it over the cycle that the D brain wraps. <coughs> and the net upshot is that it gives exact agreement with the predicted result. Okay, now I'll skip the next few slides. Okay, it works for K instantons with some minor changes. Okay, it works for the other cases. Okay. But let me just give the last, okay. so the last slide okay. before conclusion about what we want to do now. Okay, or what we are trying to do now. Okay, and that's the unknown territory. Okay, and that is to work with oriented fold of type 3 or type 3 1 Calabria or 3 folds. Okay. These give n equal to one supersymmetric theory and d equal to four, and these are really of interest from phenomenological perspective. Okay. And here are the d standard corrections generate super potential that is absent in part of the theory. And in principle, using the same techniques that you have described, one should be able to calculate the instant on generated super potential, okay. including the exact overall normalization. Okay. So this is still work in progress. So I cannot report on success or failure. Okay, it's a large collaboration, but hopefully we'll get there soon. Okay. So last slide, conclusion. Okay. So what we have learned is that a string field theory gives a systematic procedure 
for computing part of bedding and deal certain contribution to the amplitudes. Okay. And what I have said is that we should be able to apply this procedure to calculate deal certain contribution to, in situations where age duality may not be of help. Okay, that is work in progress. And the long term goal is that once you have understood how to find systematically corrections due to instant terms, okay, then perhaps one can use this to find a non perturbative definition of string theory via techniques like resurgence. Okay, but this, of course, is a very, very long term goal. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, questions from people in the audience? Yes, Somdatta, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, the I, I guess what you're trying to say is a general philosophy is that if you start with the string field theory computation, then you get uh, all these results. But if you start with the, say, the direct world sheet computation, you get the, you just get e to the a equal to one. Exactly. Yeah. And you and get another, I mean, the, the, yeah. the, and basically you, you get infinity minus infinity, right? Which you said yeah. equal to zero. Yes. Yeah. And another question is, uh, are you assuming that GS is much less than one? Yeah. So because there's an expansion in GS, right? Because I just computed the this product of these temperatures. Well, let, me, let me show this. This is a diagram that I computed, right? But it's systematically, you can compute corrections which are in power law in GS, right? Which will involve more complicated diagrams here. No, what, what, I'm, what I'm concerned about is that in the beginning, you said that the perturbation expansion in the instant tons go as one by gs to the chi. And yeah, the that chi is an overall factor. I'm not expanding that. So the, all the all of this is multiplied by this e to the minus c over gs. Yeah. So you said that chi has to be maximal. So that yes. can be that that can be only the largest contribution if gs is less than one. Yes, so I'm doing it with coupling expansion, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So clearly, GS is less than one. Yeah, but uh, w what what happens if GS becomes greater than one? Are there any situations like that? Well, then you cannot use perturbative techniques, right? I mean, you cannot even do instant on expansion, right? Because then it will be minus GS C over GS is of the same order as a perturbation expansion, right? So in instant yeah. expansion, you always do a weak coupling expansion. Just like in okay. quantum field theory. And that's what we are doing here. But even in quantum field theory, you can have situations where GS becomes greater than one, for instance, in QCD, right? Yeah, yeah. But there you cannot use instant on expansion, right? Okay. The single instant on corrections are not trustable because it to be minus one over GS is the order one. So two instant on it to the minus two over GS will be of the same order as one instant. So, so such methods won't be applicable there, right? Yeah, the weak coupling expansion will not be applicable there. Right? Unless you can sum, resum using these resurgence. Right? That's the technique that people are trying to use now. Right? Not in the in the context of string theory, but in the context of even just quantum mechanics or quantum field theory, okay? to use this technique of resurgence to resum perturbation theory. Knowing is part of an expansion. Okay, thanks. Sandeep? Yeah. Hi, Ashok. Thanks for, uh, as usual, an incredibly beautiful and clear talk. Uh, I've got two quick questions for you, if you don't mind. One is, uh, and I'm sorry, this is a bit vague, but mm, from what I recall, for example, in the KKLT context, you can have two kinds of instantons. One are D instantons contributing to a superpotential. The other is just gauge, you know, condensation on uh, some Young Mills theory, which arises, for example, when enough uh, seven brains or something come together. Yes. Uh, right. And my question was is there a way uh, through uh, various dualities, etc., to relate the D instanton contribution to the uh, Young Mills theory instanton contribution? Because the latter might be uh, sort of just fixed by cyborg methods in Young Mills theory, or is that not possible? Yeah, I think it is possible. It may be possible in some special cases, mm -hmm. but not always, because these are, I mean, for example, if you have a single D instanton, right? That's like a yeah. UR instanton. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. So, so in some special cases, I think it should be possible. Right? Okay. And then one should be able to check. Yeah. 
for example, the, the particular normalization that one gets from gauge theory, whether yeah. it exists with what you compute from the string theory side. Right, 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 right. That's what uh, I was going to ask afterwards, which is, uh, I mean, in this way of having experiment and theory, I, I'm not sure. I think you called your calculation the theory. Well, I left, left it vaguely vague <laughs> because it, you, it's up to your choice, right? What you call theory and what you call experiment. Okay. But let's call yours theory. Is there an experiment for the, uh, for the orient, uh, or orientifold cases as well already available? In no, I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think so. That's why you need to... I mean, do all these cases where the result is known, make sure that it works in all cases. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. that you can now trust it for the oriented case. Yeah. 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 Okay. And then one last sorry, then I'll, I'll, I'll get off, which is uh, Ashok, I mean, you know, so, uh, you know, in the phenomenology work, one just sort of wrote down the obvious thing, the exponential and so on, as you've emphasized, the prefactor was unknown. So far, in, and the worry always was, okay, the prefactor could be anomalously big, you know, two pi to some big power or small or something. So far in your work, is there any evidence that something like that could happen and, you know, render the estimates uh, wrong? Well, there are certainly parts of pi and two coming in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean once I think we understand this uh, calculation for the oriented fold, yeah. we'll have a better idea of what kind of factors one gets. Yeah. But it, it, it depends very much on the kind of... Uh, uh, theory are doing right how many zero modes there are and so on yeah yeah, like, yeah. so it's uh, yeah i mean you can see this these factors right i mean you got these uh, things to number of zero modes yeah yeah i mean here there are these factors right yeah and in type two i mean if you're doing 10 dimension this will be much larger factors right okay? the four will be replaced by 10 for example yeah 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 that, that was exactly the worry we had. I mean, that seems like the, in a sense, the, this is imprecise, but kind of the biggest worry, right? That you might get these kind of factors yeah. having to do with a large number of dimensions or something. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, maybe one last short question. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, I just uh, had a quick question. Uh, so, uh, uh, I think when one uses mirror symmetry, uh, one actually uh, would be required to uh, address the genus zero Gopakumar Vafa invariants. Yes. And uh, so there are these uh, old calculations by Minxing, Huang, Albrecht, Clem, which in which they actually use uh, something called a Castelnovo's theory of uh, intersection theory in marginalized spaces to ca to actually calculate them, and they turn out to be large numbers. So even in, in the context of, I think, rentifolds of Calabi house, so you'd be required to actually work with them, probably if you're having a holomorphic uh, uh, involution uh, uh, as part of your rentifold, it'll be the uh, the, uh, the the odd ones uh, in, the, in the degrees which you sum that are left. So can your, can your calculation actually be used uh, to actually estimate on the geometry side these genus of Gopakumar Vaf invariants? No, no. See, those are inputs because you see here, I described the D2 brain wrapped on three cycle, right? Okay. So the calculation that we do are for one particular D2 brain wrapped on three cycle. Okay. And then you have to add the contributions from all the uh, all such cycles, right? And that's captured by the Gopakumar Vafa invariant. So the final answer that we get will be expressed in terms of the Gopakumar Vafa invariant multiplied by what we compute as uh -huh. an operation. And I think these, uh, you know, by whatever people predict using dualities, etc., they are all expressed in terms of the Gopakumar Hoffa invariant. Right? They don't make any prediction on for the Gopakumar Hoffa invariant, and their result, in a sense, has all the symmetries for arbitrary choice of the Gopakumar Hoffa invariant. Right? That's the way the result is written. Okay, thank you, Ashok. So I guess we should move ahead to the next speaker now. Shiraz, are you online? Uh, yes, I'm here. Yeah, hi Shiraz. Hi. Yeah, so, so next speaker is Shiraz Minwala. He'll tell us about the Hilbert space of matter chain Simmons theory. I'll let you know roughly when you're, you know, if you're, if you're going over time. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Shiraz, over to you. Okay, okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Um, uh, okay. Make it a bit, bit bigger. Yeah. Make it bigger. Uh, let's see. 
might help, you know, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's better. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Excellent. So, uh, so you know, thank you for the invitation to speak and of course, a pleasure to be back at ISM. Uh, my talk today is titled The Hilbert Space of uh, Chun Simon's Matter Theories and is based uh, principally on a uh, on a long paper that hopefully will really be out this month, uh, as well as a lot of earlier work. The long paper uh, that the, the stock is principally based on is written in collaboration with uh, uh, Naveen, uh, with Amyo Mishra, my uh, graduating student, Naveen Prabhakar, who is uh, now a postdoc at ICTS, and Tarun Sharma, who is faculty member at IIT Delhi. Okay. Uh, as all of you know, Chun Simon's coupled to dynamical matter fields uh, are of interest for several reasons. I'm going to list some of them as motivation for this talk. Um, first, in parity non invariant theories, the one derivative Chun Simon's theory is the most relevant term, most relevant term made out of purely gauge fields that you can add to your Lagrangian. Okay? So, just this observation tells you that if you've got a parity non invariant uh, um, gauge theory in two plus one dimensions, you should expect its low energy dynamics to be governed by the Chern Simons term. And uh, uh, perhaps if there is some effective, some, a little bit of tuning, a Chern Simons ther a term coupled to matter. Um, second, Chern si the Chern Simons coupling is the inverse of an integer. Now, since an integer cannot change continuously, the inverse of an integer cannot change continuously. Therefore, the Chern Simons term cannot flow under the renormalization group. This tells you that uh, Chern Simons coupled gauge theories are very easily made conformal and give, uh, give rise very simply without any need for supersymmetry, for instance, to large classes of uh, conformal field theories. This also makes these theories sort of interesting from the point of view of study of critical phenomena and renormalization. Um, third, Chern Simons theories, especially when you add matter to them, um, exhibit phenomena that you don't normally see in ordinary quantum field theories. For instance, you, you see particles with non half integer spins um, and uh, uh, with that, that obey, have anionic statistics. And uh, the S matrices of these particles turn out to, to have uh, uh, to display non standard crossing relations under uh, crossing symmetry. Fourth, matter Chern Simons theories have. Uh, 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 sometimes have interesting uh, uh, large end dual descriptions, uh, sorry, uh, bulk dual descriptions via the ads CFT correspondence. For instance, ABGM theory is one, one such example, Vasiliev theories are others. Fifth, uh, Matter and Simon's theories turn out to be uh, to exhibit an invariance under, uh, to enjoy an invariance under a sort of Bose Fermi duality. Okay, uh, this became clear only once we started studying these theories, and this Bose Fermi duality is interesting. You know, to study on its own right, in its own right. But lastly, and of primary interest to my talk, you know, these theories are both dynamically interesting, but also uh, tractable in the sense that they have, uh, they admit limits that can be exactly solved. So one limit that is famously exactly solvable in the study of John Simon's, matter John Simon's theory is the limit where you take the mass to infinity. Then you reduce to a pure John Simon's theory, which Witten solved, you know, 30 odd years ago. Um, and got, got the Fields Medal for. However, about 10 years ago, uh, we and other people realized that, uh, uh, that there's another limit of these theories that is also exactly solvable. Um, a limit where, where you keep the mass, but the, ma uh, uh, but the matter is taken to be in the fundamental representation and n is taken to infinity. Uh, in such theories, large n techniques can be used to solve these theories. Um, and uh, these theories display sort of uh, display rich dynamics in this limit. Now, solvable theories of uh, solvable limits of theories are special. Um, nice things happen in solvable limits. In particular, if you've got a solvable theory, you should expect that the Hilbert space of that theory has a nice structure. Um, in this talk, I'm going to attempt to answer the question: What is a matter John Simon's theory? By trying to give you a sort of um, humanly understandable description of the Hilbert space of this theory. Um, everything I say. Today's talk will be only at large n, but we're hoping that some of these lessons will persist away from large n, perhaps in the analysis of supersymmetric indices. Okay, uh, the structure of this talk is going to be as follows. Um, computations over the, done over the last 10 years have given us explicit formulae for the uh, 
partition functions of matter John Simon's theories. I'm going to take that those formulae as data for the stock. What I'm going to do is take the known expressions and try to repackage them in, so that we get a an interpretation of these results. Okay. So in this talk, I fo focus on a particular matter John Simon's theory, uh, a theory of John Simon's UN level K John Simon's theory, coupled to bosonic matter and the fundamental representation. This bosonic matter has a kinetic term, a mass term, and some interactions. Okay. Uh, this theory is sometimes in the literature is called the regular boson theory. This is the theory I will specialize. I will focus on this talk. In our upcoming paper, we've we've studied every every ev every well understood theory, but for, because of a, for the interest, in the interest of time, I focus on this one theory. Okay. Now, um, one quick thing that I will need from previous work about this theory is the following. You know, this this theory is a large n theory, which, as I explained, as I mentioned, is uh, uh, exactly solvable in a, at large n. Many quantities you are interested in computing can be computed exactly at large n in this theory. One of the quantities that we computed maybe three years ago, and I think I reported it on this result in the last ISM meeting, is the exact quantum effective action. By exact, I mean exact large n quantum effective action as a function of Toft coupling. Um, uh, exact large n quantum effective action of this theory um, as a function of the gauge invariant uh, operator phi bar phi. Now, the computation of this large n effective action is complicated. Okay, but well, the final result turns out to be amazingly simple. And uh, the result, the final result is simply this, that the classical effective action listed on this line here is renormalized um, for the values of phi that are relevant to the unhinged phase of the theory, which I'll focus on throughout in this talk, um, are, is renormalized simply to this quantum effective action, where all that's changed is that this one here in the classical theory has been replaced by four by three. Okay, very complicated, many pages of calculation, but fi very simple final answer. Okay, so now with this in mind, I'm going to I'm going to try to um, ask what do we what can we say about the thermal partition function of this theory, and I'm going to try to answer this question in a couple of steps. First, by trying to guess the answer using some intuition, and then presenting the final answer of a genuine calculation to you. Suppose you were to try to guess the answer for the thermal partition function of the theory, of this theory. One thing you might do is to say, well, first. Let's remove this. You know, what makes this theory complicated is the interaction of matter with gauge fields. So as a baby warm up, let's just try to look at the same theory, but removing the gauge fields. Uh, the one thing I'm going to do is to take not exactly the same theory, but the same theory with the classical action replaced by its quantum effective action. Okay, so it's four by three, not the one. Now, can we compute the thermal uh, partition? Yes. So, uh, so the reason for the non-renormalization of this effective action is could be due to the hidden supersymmetry. Uh, there's no supersymmetry. The there's no supersymmetry in this theory. The theory has a bosonic field, bosonic matter field, but no fermionic matter. No, so no you said you said in the beginning that there was some hidden supersymmetry in the. I don't know. Maybe you said. Uh, I, maybe I misspoke. I, I said even in the absence of supersymmetry is what I meant to say. There's no supersymmetry. Supersymmetry so plays no role in this. I, well, it'll play one role at some point, but yeah, go on. Why is, uh, why is then the effective action non-renormalized? It's not non-renormalized. It's renormalized very simply. This one has become a four by three. Why? We, we get, get it from a computation. You know, you can compute this effective action uh, at large n, and this is what we find. You know, uh, so I don't have anything more interesting to say. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So, um, one might try to compute the thermal partition function of this theory, just the ungauged theory, but with the potential replaced by its by its quantum by its correct quantum effective action. So, you've taken account one fe feature of this UN interactions, the part that renormalizes this effective potential. Now, this computation is trivial to perform, so trivial that we can do it in one slide. See, take the theory that I wrote down on the last transparency, which I've rewritten here. And notice that this theory can be recast sort of exactly with the age of Lagrange multiplier field CB squared and sigma as this theory. Now, it may not be immediately apparent to your eye that these two theories are, are the same. But if you look carefully, you'll see that CB squared appears only two places. Yeah? And so the CB squared equation of motion tells you that sigma is equal to 2 pi phi bar, phi bar phi by n. 
And then when you substitute sigma is equal to 2 pi 5 bar 5 by n, uh, you recover this, uh, this, this theory. So uh, the path integral of, of over phi and CB squared and sigma over appropriate contours uh, of this action is just exactly the same as this. Now in the large n limit, uh, we, okay. Now what we've achieved by this rewriting is we've made the dependence of, of the phi on, of uh, this action on phi quadratic. So we can just integrate phi out. Phi is effectively a free scalar field with mass squared CB squared, okay? So in the large n limit, uh, you obtain the partition function here, which is just the partition function over a free Fox space of mass CB, and then some dressing factors include, uh, uh, which are functions of these Lagrange multipliers. Away from large n, we still have to do a path integral over these, these uh, Lagrange multipliers, and the, the theory is complicated. But at large n, we just have to extremize this, this, this Lagrangian with respect to these Lagrange multipliers. If we make the plausible assumption that the saddle point values are translationally invariant, we get this very simple expression for the effective uh, for the thermal partition function of this theory. The partition function of a, a free boson dressed by some factors including uh, depending on the mass and some other Lagrange multipliers and then extremized over CB squared and sigma. <laughs> okay, now the computation of the previous section works on any spatial manifold. So let's focus for the rest of this talk on the sp a spatial manifold being a sphere of volume V2. Now, in such a space, it's certainly too crude to ignore the UN gauge field completely. At the very least, we should expect that the interaction with UN will impose a sort of Gauss law that will tell you that all physical states are UN singlets. So at our next level of crudity in trying to guess this, guess the answer, we might take the previous answer and then just try to project it down to, S, to UN singlets. But now projecting this answer down to UN singlets, well, what does it mean? Well, all we have to do is to take the Fox space partition function and project that down to UN singlets. But that's done by twisting the partition function with respect to a, to a, uh, to a, to a UN matrix U and integrating over U. So this is the next level of uh, crudity in our, you know, next level of sophistication in our crude guesses. This is another guess you might have for this partition function. Okay, now we're going to stop guessing and then just look at what the actual answer is. The actual answer that comes from detailed computation, including, you know, summing over many gauge, gauge boson loops and so on, infinite numbers of these uh, by Schwinger Dyson equations. The actual answer turns out to be remarkably similar to this guy. The actual answer turns out to be given by exactly the same dressing factor that we had here. Okay. But this projection of the free boson but a uh, uh, partition function projected down to the UN singlet condition replaced by this quantity IBCB, where IBCB is also very similar to what we had here. It involves an integral over a unitary matrix, the trace of the twisted partition function of a free boson, but then another factor, and crucially the point that this, this integral is performed not over the Haar measure as it was previously, but with a, with a deformed measure. I'm going to tell you what this measure is. The deformed measure is, is, is defined as follows. The deformed measure is just the Haar measure. However, you know, you define an eigenvalue density function as usual when you're dealing with large n matrix integrals. And you limit your integration regime to those, uh, those, those unitary matrices such that point-wise, the eigenvalue distribution function is never larger than one over two pi mod lambda. Where lambda was the Toft coupling of this uh, churn side. This is what comes out of computation. Okay, so comparing the naive answer with the actual answer, we see that the only difference between these two answers is that the projection down to UN singlets of the Fox space singlet uh, of the Fox space partition function is replaced by this more complicated quantity, which is almost uh, like a projection down to UN singlets, except it's done with a funny measure and it has uh, an extra factor. Okay, I will now explain that this funny thing this IB has a beautiful interpretation. IB is simply the projection of the free Fermi Fox space down to the space of West amino witten singlets. Okay. In this talk, I'm going to focus on uh, uh, the, what we call the type 1 UN theory, which is a UN theory whose SUN level is K and U1 part of level is kappa. Um, uh, just for simplicity, the, the many other theories that are of interest and we've done them all in our paper. Okay, so two minutes of background. 
consider pure Chan Simon theory on S2 times S1 with M Wilson lines, or one at each point on the on different points on the sphere, wrapping time. These Wilson lines are taken to be in representations R1, R2, up to Rm. Okay. In his classic work on Chan Simon's theory, Witten demonstrated that the result of this path integral was simply the number of conformal blocks in chiral Wessemino Witten theory uh, with insert, primary operator insertions of R1 in representations R1 up to Rm. This number of conformal blocks can be evaluated using the Weldon Day formula, uh, but can also be directly evaluated in three dimensions, as we're now going to uh, as I'm now going to describe. Basically, the, there are two methods that we've employed in our paper. Uh, one of them is just to directly evaluate this path integral using a method developed by Blau and Thompson about 30 years ago. Chen Simon series is simple enough, pure Chen Simon series, simple enough theory that you can directly evaluate these path integrals. Uh, Blau and Thompson worked in the case of SUN, S, SUN theory, really they were very explicit for SU2 theory. We generalized their results to type 1 UNK theory. There's a subtlety that we have to take care of in that generalization. The second method we use uh, along these lines is, uh, uh, is to use supersymmetry. We use the fact that pure John Simon theory uh, is the same as pure n equals 2 supersymmetric John Simon theory. And so we can compute Wilson line expectation values using supersymmetric localization. Both these methods give us the same answer, uh, an answer that can also be shown to be, agree with the Valinde formula, but in a form that is much more useful to us than you might have originally got from the Valinde formula. Okay, one quick caution, all formulae apply only to rep representations in integrable representations, you know, uh, Wilson lines in integrable representations. Um, it would be very interesting to understand this point better. Okay, so with all these caveats out of the way, um, yeah, now, Maybe 70 or 80 pages in our upcoming paper are devoted to these technicalities, which I'm brush brushing aside in two slides, um, and devoted to formulae like, like this and their, st their study. Uh, but uh, uh, in tomorrow's, in his talk tomorrow, Naveen Prabhakar will describe this, these technical aspects in, in much more detail than I am. So I'm just going, going to give you the final result. <laughs> ah, the result is this, um, the total number of singlets Okay, if you've got these insertions of operators, the total number of singlets, uh, total number of conformal blocks is given by a very simple formula. What you're supposed to do is to evaluate the characters of your representations on unitary matrices whose eigenvalues are sort of special. All eigenvalues have to be either a kapath root of unity or a kapath root of minus one, depending on whether n is odd or even. Okay. You have to choose the eigenvalues to be distinct kapath roots of unity or minus one and sum over all such choices uh, with this Vandermont type measure with the normalization and with the insertions of the characters. Once you do that, that sum uh, always evaluates an to an integer and always gives you the number of conformal blocks. Okay, uh, Naveen will tell you more about this tomorrow. Now, this formula here is uh, those of you who are familiar with the little group theory will see that this formula is a very particular discretization of the while integral formula of classical group theory. In particular, in the large n limit, the spacing between different allowed eigenvalues goes to zero. And this, this sum over eigenvalues reduces to, a, uh, reduces to an integral over eigenvalue density functions. However, because the eigenvalues are discrete and cannot be occupied twice, when you see what kind of continuous eigenvalue distribution functions contribute, you conclude that this, uh, uh, the only eigenvalue distribution functions are, that contribute are those whose density of eigenvalues obeys an inequality, in fact, precisely the inequality we saw before, namely that the eigenvalue density function cannot be pointwise larger than 2 pi by lambda. Okay, so, so now the restriction to UN, to uh, uh, West Amino Witten singlets, turns into an integral which is just the analog of integrating over unitary matrices, except that you do it with this funny measure, this measure which restricts you to this, to particular space of eigenvalue density functions. And uh, uh, so we see we've almost declared, we, we can almost declare victory. You might have thought that if this other funny term wasn't there, this quantity would now be the restriction of the bosonic Hilbert space, Fox space, to the space of West Amino Witten signals. But this other term is there, and what does it mean? And the other term is actually reminding us that something that we did was going too far. We, we, were, we, were, we, were, we, were, we were going too fast. So let me remind you that the 
partition function over the bosonic hilbert space is simply a partition a uh, free bosonic fox space simply a partition function of each single particle state one at a time and because there are both fundamentals and anti fundamentals we've got two factors for each state this this uh, uh, product here is a product over all single particle states on the sphere bosonic single particle states on the sphere okay this is just the usual boss way of writing a free boson partition function w's are the eigenvalues of this of this unitary matrix but the partition function in any given state can be then expanded in an in a sum over un characters because we're looking at bosons the only characters that appear are characters in the completely completely symmetric representations with n boxes where n runs from 0 to infinity so what we computed what, the, what 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 this formula without this quantity here would have computed would be to use the formula the path integral formula for the verlinde formula and put insert the wessemino witten singlet condition on this sum however that does not correctly count conformal blocks that does not correctly con count conformal blocks because the path integral formula that i gave you was correctly counting conformal blocks only when all representations that were inserted were integrable representations uh there are no conformal blocks with non-integrable insertions this was explained by gepner and witten over 35 maybe 35 years ago so what we're supposed to do if we're really interested in looking at the restriction to conformal blocks is to take the sum and truncate it to integrable representations okay now um the truncation to integrable representations is, is integrable representations is just those whose row lengths are less than or equal to kappa kb so the truncation to inter integrable representations is simply given by truncating this sum to kb not to, the upper limit should go to kb not to infinity okay <laughs> and then when you process that you find that that's the same thing as replacing this 1 over 1 minus ziy this infinite kind of product without the truncation but dressing it by an upstairs factor that kills off all the other terms so now when you look at the partition function you need to take um logs of this term but as well as this term now this term here in in the in the context the physical context y is equal to eta minus uh, b, uh, e to the power minus beta into e minus uh, e minus mu and it's raised to a very large power kappa which is going to infinity in the large n limit so there's a discontinuous difference between this term the between the log of this term here uh uh, depending on whether y is less than 1 or greater than 1 when y is less than 1 this log just vanishes that's the case where all states have energies less than the chemical potential when y is greater than 1 on the other hand this guy this term gives you a kappa log y uh, log of a, um uh, yeah sorry this should have been a, a kappa log y okay where was it? yeah and uh, uh and when you uh, uh when you you process all this and put you know sum over all the single particle states on the sphere you recover exactly this fact okay so this this partition function ib here is precisely the truncation of this of this uh, fox base of bosons to uh, uh to uh, uh the westmino to set of westmino witten singlets to set of non trivial westmino witten conformal blocks in the last slide we've learned something important what we realize now you know the, the interpretation of truncating the sum to k rather than infinity tells you that no single particle state can be occupied by more than kb bosons call this fact the this 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 phenomenon the bosonic exclusion principle it's the direct level rank dual of the more obvious result for fermionic theory namely that no single particle fermionic state can be occupied more than nf times simply because there are no more than nf different distinct fermions uh, to occupy in a state consistent with uh, pauli statistics okay now recall that ordinary free boson bosonic theories are ill defined at values of the chemical potential greater than the mass as that leads to catastrophic bose condensation these sta some states are infinitely occupied that problem is removed in these theories by the bosonic exclusion principle because no state can be occupied more, more than kb times so this this phenomenon tells us that this Ch matter chan simons theory the chan simons will cure that the runaway instability of free bosons uh, at chemical potential larger than larger than mu uh, larger than the mass okay um so just to re recall a partition function is given by just a very simple guess but by replacing the projection of the bosonic fox space to un singlets to the 
projection to West Amino Witten techniques. Now, uh, there are two or three things I want to emphasize about this result. The first is that every for a sphere of, you know, both big and small spheres. Now, the projection onto UN singlets is trivial in the limit that the sphere size goes to infinity. This is because it's like one condition, like n square conditions, n square Gauss law conditions imposed on a very large Fox space, and that those n square conditions are meaningless. This is well well known. Okay, what is the what is the corresponding situation with these West Amino Witten singlets? Well, that's easy to analyze. You see, at five, even if we just take this projection of the free boson partition function, we can do that at finite n n k. Even though the formula is really valid, only at large n k, we can. This part of the analysis can e easily be done at finite n k, and uh, requires us to, you know, perform a summation over all eigenvalue distributions, like the uh, eigenvalue configurations, uh, obeying this condition. Now, in the limit that the number of insertions that you put into the Verlinde formula goes to infinity. You can easily show that this sum reduces to a saddle point. I mean, it reduces to one term. It just is dominated by the one eigenvalue configuration that contributes maximally. And you can also, well, show or plausibly argue, maybe is more accurate, that the one eigenvalue configuration that dominates this this thing is the eigenvalue configuration I've listed here. Um, for those of you familiar with West Amino Witten the uh, theory and Willende formula kind of thing, it's the eigenvalue configuration dual by via the Verlinde formula to the identity representation. It's a very, very special eigenvalue. Okay, this, this dominates that sum. Okay, because this dominates that sum, the partition function of the bosonic theory, which was, you know, something like this and then summed over various eigenvalues, because only one term is contributing this limit, it's just a product of partition functions, one for each single particle state. Okay, so you get a product of partition functions, one for each single particle state, and so the partition function starts looking like it's free because that's that's how free partition functions are you get a partition function one for each single particle state and then product of all of these okay however this partition function is not really free it's not really free because these zas here are not genuine partition functions in the sense that their expansion is not in terms of integers okay um in particular you can work out the formula for these zas and uh, it turns out that this formula here is given by um, uh, this expression where odd, where combinatorial factors, ordinary combinatorial factors that would have been integers here in, in the ordinary free bosonic theory are replaced by more complicated quantities, uh, which are given here, the Q version analogs of these combinatorial factors, and they have simple rep, uh, interpretation in chat, uh, Chern, uh, in, Chern, in Chern Simons or Wesemino Witten theory. Um, they are the uh, quantum dimensions of the n-box symmetric representation. Okay, um, there's a similar expression here. I've not presented fermions through this talk, but everything I, I've said here goes through also for fermions, has a, an analog for fermions. Now, what's the point here? Why, 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 why have I brought this up? Uh, ignoring all details for the moment, um, a completely striking aspect of this large volume limit is that it's a product of part your partition function becomes a product of partition functions one for each um, each single particle state. However, the single particle state partition functions are now deformed away from their free values. So this naively suggests the theory is becoming free, but we've seen that, that can't be the case because these single particle partition functions have non-integer, you know, when the, their expansion is not in terms of integer. There's no well-defined single particle Hilbert space. What's going on? How can it be that a theory is both interacting? It's not free. But its partition function is a product of single particle partition functions. Sounds like a contradiction, right? It's a product because what's happening here doesn't affect what's happening there. But if, if that's the case, it should be free. Um, uh, we've thought sort of hard about this and we came to the conclusion that uh, uh, what's going on here is something very interesting. Turns out that the representation theory, the fusion algebra of West Amino Witten theories, or at least we conjecture, we've not 100% proved this, but we've got given good evidence for what I'm saying now. <laughs> Uh, um, has a very interesting universality. The universality goes like this. Suppose you take a bunch of representations and then you fuse them and then fuse them and fuse them and then look at their complete representation content. And you ask how many representations of type of this type do I get? And how many representations of that type do I get when, when I do the continued fusing? To get the actual answers, the actual numbers, when you've got a finite number of insertions, um, well, that depends on the details of what you've inserted. 
But in the limit that the number of representations becomes very large, um, the ratios of these numbers, sort of independent of what you've inserted, take on a universal, uh, universal flavor. The, the ratios of these numbers become the ratio of the quantum dimensions of the, uh, of the corresponding representations. So as I say, we've not completely proved this, but we've given substantial, we've given what I think considers substantial evidence for the state. Now this explains this, part, uh, this, this uh, factorization of the partition function, because you see, one way of thinking of how one state contributes, how, the interactions of one state with all the others are only through this wesumino witten singlet projection condition. The universality tells us that the interactions effectively, I mean, from the point, of, except perhaps in a constant overall, does not depend on the details of what's happening in the other states because you get universal ratios of numbers. Okay, um, uh, one last thing, and I'm sort of done. But one one last thing is 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 the follow is as follows: these single particle partition functions are sort of interesting, and uh, um, as I said, there is sort of deformation of the single particle partition function for free bosons, but uh, um, these. Uh, 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 they are Q deformation. Um, okay, maybe I don't have the time to explain this in much detail, but uh, you know you can take these numbers, and of course there's one limit where Q goes to one, where they reduce to the ordinary single particle bosonic partition function. But there's another limit, a limit that I've uh, uh, listed here, in which they become the numbers you would see in a single in a free fermion single particle partition function. So in some sense, these single particle fun uh, part uh, particle functions interpolate continuously between those of free bosons and free fermions. Okay, and uh, that's naturally ties in with duality. Um, on the other hand, when you know, when we're somewhere in the middle, they're neither free bosons nor free bo fermions. It's something else. It's a new statistic. Okay, just to give you a flavor of the kind of thing that happens, the expectation number of number of particles in a given single particle state, um, it takes this value in for free boson theory. This is something we're all familiar with. Um, in the large end limit at fixed lambda, this formula is generalized to this sort of uglier, but still quite simple looking formula that generalizes this, this fix. So there's a completely new statistic. Um, oh, oh, yeah, fine. Okay, so what have we concluded? So we've concluded that basically all that change between our simple guess of taking the ungauged theory and restricting to UN singlets um, was that we had to restrict not to UN singlet, but singlets, but to Wesumino witten singlets. Okay, what do we conclude? This is surprising in many ways. You see, when you actually solve this theory, you integrate out, we do it by integrating out the gauge fields. Now that integrating out the gauge fields gives you a horribly non-local action. And then you put that horribly non-local action into the quantity you want to compute and you get an answer. What I just tried to explain to you is that the entire effect, as far as, as far as the large the partition function is concerned, the entire effect of integrating out that gauge field is one completely local thing, which is renormalizing the quantum effective action. And other than that, all the other non-locality plays just one role, namely imposing this Westermino witten singlet condition. So the theory is effectively local, but subject to this one non-local constraint, uh, written just in terms of matter. The whole effect of integrating out the gauge field is to impose that one constraint. Okay, so we have conclusions. Um, I, I think I'm out of time, so I won't, won't spell out these conclusions. Maybe I can say just two things here. Two things I'd really like to do is this. First, I'd like to take the supersymmetric index of supersymmetric matter John Simon's theories at finite NNK and see if I can interpret those formulae in, in language similar to those, uh, uh, some deformation of what I've used in this, this, this talk. Uh, this sort of almost guaranteed to work at large N. But I wanted to see whether something like this holds also at finite NNK. Since supersymmetric indices are available, this seems like a plausible project. Uh, the second thing I want to say is that something that's sort of irritating uh, and is sort of central to our paper is the fact that we, that when we evaluated the path integral of matter chan Simon, oh, sorry, of just pure chan Simon's theory with insertions, the fact that we, one, th the thing that we know from Wesumino witten theory, namely that if you put a non-integrable representation into the, into the path integral, you get zero, does not automatically seem to come out of the path integral. I suspect, you know, there's subtlety in the path integral that makes that happen. I would really like to understand why that, that, that's the case. Uh, this is very important because that, that is the underlying mechanism between these, before, uh, for this Bose exclusion principle. Okay, thank you. Okay, one quick question, Rajesh.
Rajesh, you have to unmute. Yeah, hello, sorry. Uh, no thanks, problem. Shiraz, uh, very nice talk. Uh, just uh, actually uh, two, uh, uh, two small questions. Uh, one is uh, the, uh, you, you mentioned how the Chan Simons theory regulates the Bose condensation catastrophe. Uh, uh, so I was just wondering if you take the limit as this stuffed coupling goes to zero, uh, is there a universality there? I mean, uh, because you get it diverges in that limit, right? Presumably, yes. as the the coupling goes to zero, and you're regulating that divergence. But I was. Uh, I can't hear you anymore, Rajesh. Is that me or? Something universal. Rajesh, you're going in and out. Uh, yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? The question. Yeah. The yeah, uh, I, we, I heard you up to if if you take the if you take KB to be large, is there something universal? And then I couldn't hear you. Anymore. Yeah, uh, whether the, there's something universal to that divergent piece, because you might expect in actual physical systems, uh, similar divergence is regulated, um, and and there might be something universal to that. I, I just was wondering yeah. if you had any thought about, or does it have a nice form? The divergent well, the coefficient actually, of the, the the thing that diverges. Yeah. You know, actually, it's very simple. Very, there's one very simple thing to say about it, well, which is this. You see, um, one way of understanding what's going on is to dualize. When you dualize, this guy becomes it, a Fermi uh, surface. Yes. Hmm. Okay. Now, the Fermi surface is not divergent in any way in this lambda goes to zero limit because uh, because that's it's just some nice Fermi surface. Right. The way that works is that th that divergence is entirely a fa this factor of n. Okay. You know, uh, bosonic partition functions are naturally proportional to n, nb, mm -hmm. and fermionic partition functions are naturally proportional to nf. Okay. And in this weak coupling limit, uh, where the bosonic coupling is very weak, nb is getting parametrically larger than nf. Okay. So this divergence is entirely somehow seeing that fact, that overall outside fact. You can take that overall piece sort of out, and after that becomes just the theory of a Fermi surface. Hmm. But that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 It is. And actually, you see how it's happening, right? You know, basically, what's a Fermi surface? A famous Fermi surface is a, a, something when all states up to a certain energy are occupied. Hmm. Um, in the Fermi surface, all states are occupied once. Fine. Hmm. If you have NF fermions, all states would be N occupied NF times. Here we get a Bose Fermi surface, a Bose surface, because all states are occupied at zero temperature, but occupied NB times. Sorry, hmm. KB times. Hmm. So it's very similar in spirit. You know, you you have a hard space in uh, in uh, in momentum space. You know, hard surface in momentum space. You would have all these collective excitations of this Bose Bose content. So it basically turns this boson into a Fermi surface, into a gas of Fermi on somehow. Okay. Yeah. Very nice. So uh, thanks. Uh, uh, I had a smaller second question, but maybe in the interest of time, I can uh, skip that. Thanks. Thanks, Shiraz. Okay. Thank you. So, Omkar Parikar is the next speaker. Omkar, you must be online. Uh, yes, I'm here. Uh, let me just share my screen. Yeah, sure. Okay, so the last speaker of this morning session is Omkar Parikar. He will tell us about um, his quantum error correction in the black hole interior. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah. Just go to the first page here. Yeah. Oh, sure. Perfect. Yeah, okay. start Please go Great. Ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak at this wonderful meeting. Um, so I wanted to tell you about um, some work uh, I've been doing with uh, Vijay Balsubramanian, Arjun Kaur, uh, and Kathy Lee uh, on the quantum error correction in the black hole interior. So um, recent progress on evaporating black holes um, has shown that after uh, the page time, a portion of the black hole interior, uh, namely the island, uh, is encoded in the radiation. Uh, there, is, there have been several papers on this subject, and I've only listed a few here. Um, but the setup uh, of, these, uh, of these calculations roughly involves uh, some holographic quantum system, which I'm going to try and call B throughout the stock. Uh, so this B, we can think of uh, uh, the, the state of B or one could think of as being sort of uh, holographically dual to a black hole. 
Um, and then this, is, this quantum system B is coupled to a bath, let's call it R, uh, which absorbs the, the radiation, okay? Uh, and as I said, the semi-classical dual description uh, consists of this black hole dual to B um, radiating into the bath. And you know, these calculations, as you all know, show that after the page time, uh, a new quantum extremal surface develops in the, in the space-time dual to B, um, and uh, the portion, um, the, the island part of the, of the space-time moves over to the entanglement wedge of the bath. Now, a quantum error correction uh, provides the sort of underlying framework um, for entanglement wedge reconstruction, um, and the sort of most familiar setup in which uh, this is well understood is, for example, when you have uh, some quantum extremal surface in, in, in the bulk space time, and then the entanglement wedge, namely the sort of uh, domain of dependence of the region enclosed between this QES and the boundary, boundary subregion A, um, uh, is encoded. So the degrees of freedom in the entanglement wedge of some boundary subregion A uh, are encoded in A, such that any errors happening on A complement uh, do not affect uh, the, the degrees of freedom in the entanglement wedge of A. Now, in the context of the island, we expect a very similar, um, uh, a very similar uh, encoding where the semi-classical degrees of freedom in the island uh, would be expected or are encoded in this way uh, in the radiation Hilbert space. Um, but in this talk, we wish to understand uh, how robust this particular encoding is against quantum errors acting on the radiation or on the bath. Okay, motivated by the, the results in this recent nice work by Kim Breskill and Tang. Now, just to point out that um, the, the, error, the, the kind of errors that we are interested in exploring here uh, occur on the same um, boundary factor, namely the path uh, where the island is encoded. Um, so the, this quantum error correction is a slightly uh, different and a slightly more robust version of error correction than than the one that's more perhaps more familiar uh, in ADSCFT. Okay, so let me just uh, uh, begin with a, a, a small overview um, of the, the 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 sort of framework uh, behind quantum error correction. Um, so uh, the the general the setup involves um, sort of uh, an encoding of a smaller Hilbert space, which we might call the code subspace. Uh, into a larger Hilbert space, which I'm calling here the physical Hilbert space, okay? So this encoding map V uh, is uh, an isometry, namely it satisfies, it, it preserves inner products. Um, and the, the general theory of quantum error correction deals with the question of, um, you know, when can we recover uh, these encoded states uh, from the physical system after the potential action of some errors uh, on the physical system? Sorry. Um, now, in, in this context, an error is modeled um, by some quantum channel, uh, which I'm uh, calling E. Uh, you can think of a, a quantum channel uh, as a, gen a sort of generalized quantum operation, um, which maps density matrices on, on H physical uh, to other density matrices on H physical. I'll give a more explicit uh, description of quantum channels in the next slide. Uh, but the idea is to, is to model errors happening on the physical system by quantum channels and then ask, well, when does the encoded state, uh, it, when is the encoded state preserved uh, under such errors? Now, as I said, we can think of the action of any quantum channel E, a, a, a very general quantum channel E, uh, in, terms of, um, uh, in terms of an ancillary or auxiliary environment factor. So we, we imagine that there is some, um, uh, some auxiliary uh, Hilbert space, namely the environment Hilbert space, um, which is sort of is brought in in some fiducial state, which I'm calling E naught here. And you know, the action of this quantum channel on some density matrix rho on the physical Hilbert space is, is, is given by sort of uh, acting on the, on the join system, the, the, the original density matrix rho, together with this auxiliary state on the environment, then act on the full, full system by some unitary transformation u, uh, and then trace out the environment, okay? So you can think of this, in, uh, this environment as some sort of um, noise that is um, some external noise 
um, that is in, in, introduced by this particular coupling uh, U. Um, and so this is the, the most general form of a, of a quantum channel that we will consider. Um, and we say that uh, an error E uh, can be corrected if there exists a recovery channel R such that R acting- I have a question. Uh, yes, please. Uh, so uh, is the environment uh, density matrix, environment channel density matrix a pure state? Uh, is considered a pure state? Yeah, so in this in this case, I'm considering it to be a pure state. It doesn't have to be, but uh, it's without loss of generality, you can always take E naught to be a pure state. Because if it weren't, then you could always purify by introducing a bigger environment. But I would uh, I would guess that an environment usually would be something that is kind of random or something, right? Because yeah, because even, it's like a part of. That's right. So even if it is, if it, so that you're right, but even if it is a mixed state, then you can always purify that by introducing some auxiliary, uh, some, some more environment degrees of freedom, and then consider that to be your, um, your new environment state, uh, uh, the, 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 the auxiliary state that you're bringing in. So it, what I'm saying is that without loss of generality, you can always write any quantum channel in this way. Uh, where just for simplicity, I'm taking E naught to be a pure state, but it doesn't have to be. Okay. okay. With, without loss of generality, you can always write this. Okay. Um, so um, as I was saying, uh, uh, the the we we say that this this error channel E can be corrected um, on the code subspace, uh, provided that it exists the recovery channel R such that R acting on E acting on rho gives back rho. Uh, for all density matrices which have support on the code subspace. Okay. Now, one of the central results of the theory of quantum error correction um, is a sort of nice and uh, interesting condition for when an error is correctable. So in order to tell you this condition, I have to introduce uh, a, a, another uh, sort of references, which I, what I'm, we're going to call a reference system, um, uh, href. Uh, this reference system is isomorphic to the code subspace, namely the subspace of states that, or the, the space of states that you want to encode uh, in the physical Hilbert space. And having introduced this reference system, what you do is you basically consider sort of the maximally entangled state between the reference and the physical Hilbert space. So here the psi, the capital psi i's are the encoded states, uh, the encoded states in the physical Hilbert space. So you consider, roughly speaking, the maximally entangled state between the reference and the physical Hilbert space, and then you act on this joint system with your quantum channel. Okay. So this, the action of this unitary U on the physical Hilbert space and the environment factor is sort of implementing your quantum channel um, on, the, on the physical Hilbert space. So let's call that full state psi prime. And then um, this general result states, uh, that this error E is correctable if and only if um, for the state psi prime, uh, the reduced density matrix on the reference and environment uh, factors uh, uh, just factorizes. So there is, in, in other words, there's no mutual information in the state psi prime between the reference and the environment. Okay, so this is sometimes called the decoupling principle. And as you can imagine, since it's sort of stated in terms of, um, of, of entropic quantities, um, at least from a gravitational perspective, uh, it sort of makes things computationally uh, easier or, or more tractable. So this is the criterion for quantum error correction that I'm going to uh, focus on. Okay, so so let's now move on to the the, the setup for uh, for the ca calculation in black holes. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, study uh, this uh, sort of uh, quantum error correction criterion in a particular time model for an evaporating black hole. Uh, which was constructed in this uh, nice paper from 2019. So the idea is to uh, sort of model your evaporating black hole after the page time, or uh, to, to model your evaporating black hole as an entangled state um, between your quantum system B, which is dual to this black hole, uh, and the bath, which I'm calling R here. Now these states psi sub alpha, psi alpha, um, you could think of as um, 
states of uh, this quantum system B, which are dual to uh, black holes with an end of the world brain uh, deep in the interior of the space time. And the label alpha on these states uh, labels sort of an internal degree of freedom, uh, which you can think of as living on this end of the world brain. Okay. On the other hand, uh, the, the, the sort of states labeled by alpha on the bath side uh, are just given by some orthonormal basis of states uh, for the bath. Okay. So, so this, this then is some entangled state uh, between the black, the quantum system B dual to the black hole uh, and the bath R. Okay. And the, so the, the number of terms in the superposition, which is uh, labeled by K, um, sort of this, this integer K uh, plays the role in this time model of the evaporation time. Um, so when K is much, much smaller than E to the S naught, where S naught is the um, entropy of the black hole, um, uh, sorry, when K is much, much greater than E to the S naught, that's the post phage time phase. Um, and this region uh, shaded in blue here, uh, which is in, in this case, the island, uh, moves over into the entanglement bed of the radiation. Now, to study quantum error correction uh, in this context, we need to introduce what we mean by a code subspace. So we can do that uh, pretty easily by considering some excitations uh, I and I prime, uh, which lie within the interior and the exterior of um, uh, the black hole respectively. Um, and you know, just, just to be uh, clear, the, these kind of states which have some excitation I in the interior of the black hole and some excitation I prime in the exterior of the black hole uh, can be constructed uh, from the dual quantum mechanics point of view uh, with, the, with, this, with sort of a Euclidean path integral um, with some sources turned on um, and the, the, the label alpha on the end of the world brain can be um, thought of as the sort of boundary condition at the other end of the Euclidean path integral. And very roughly speaking, the dual, the dual bulk geometry will then com comprise of this black hole with an end of the world brain uh, with some degree of freedom alpha living on the brain and uh, a state i uh, for, the, for the excitation in the interior and i prime for the excitation in the exterior. Okay, so the main question we wish to address now in the setting um, is this. Um, after the page, page, page point, wh which is when k is much, much greater than e to the s naught, um, what kind of errors acting on the bath Hilbert space uh, HR are correctable for the encoding of the interior subsystem, or the, the in particular the island portion of the of the black hole space time. Hi, Okar. I had a quick question, if you don't yes, mind. Yes, please. Yes, please. So, in the yes. previous picture, the left hand side and the right hand side uh, is that is that's is that a schematic picture or is there a calculation behind it? So this is uh, well, the the right hand picture is schematic because okay. the left yeah, hand yeah. the left hand picture is very well defined. Okay. What you're expect, what you're supposed to do is, of course, compute overlaps uh, of these kind of states, and then what happens is that at least the um, zero order thing that happens is that such overlaps will get filled in by space times in the bulk, which look like the right hand side picture. Right, right. Yeah. No, I just wanted to. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Great. Very good. Um, so uh, the question we want to address then is uh, which errors acting on the bath are correctable for the encoding of the interior subsystem. And as I said before, uh, these errors are going to be modeled by the action of some quantum channel E uh, on this bath Hilbert space. Uh, and uh, we've discussed this again, but previously, but let me just remind you, uh, you can model this bath, this, this, uh, this quantum channel E uh, by considering some environment factor, some auxiliary environment factor, and then like performing a joint unitary uh, on the environment uh, and the bath. Now, in order to use the decoupling principle for quantum error correction, uh, we need to also introduce uh, reference systems, as you'll remember. And because we have um, uh, the code subspace has this natural tensor factorization between the interior and the exterior, uh, we need to introduce a reference which also has a similar factorization. So we introduce essentially like two cop two. Um, Two reference systems, one corresponding to the interior degrees of freedom, the other corresponding to the exterior degrees of freedom, 
uh, and we construct this sort of maximally entangled state between the reference and the physical uh, system uh, and then act on that uh, with this unitary u uh, which corresponds to the quantum channel okay so this is this is the the entire um, state that we are interested in for the black hole uh, and now the the last thing that remains to be done is to just compute uh, this particular mutual information between so if we were interested in the encoding of the interior degrees of freedom what we would do is we would compute the mutual information between the interior reference system uh, with the exterior reference system and the environment uh, and check whether this is zero or not. So in particular, if this mutual information is zero, um, then we conclude that the, the error is correctable. Um, and um, if, if not, then, uh, then not. Okay. Uh, but of course, as you, as you probably know, for gravity computations, it is, uh, it, it, it is somewhat more convenient to consider um, Rennie mutual informations instead of um, um, the entanglement mutual informations, uh, and then then consider the n going to one limit in, in the end of the computation. So that's that's what we are going to consider. We are going to study these sort of Rennie versions of uh, of these mutual informations uh, that that we've defined. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to like study this mutual information, the Rennie version of this mutual information. Um, using uh, JT gravity, um, which is where these uh, various black hole states were defined uh, in the uh, West Coast model. Um, so just, just to give you a flavor for the computation, I'll, I'll, I'll present one, um, one of the terms that is uh, relevant for the Rennie mutual information, and then I'll just tell you what the, what the results are. So for example, if you wanted to compute something like trace of rho prime to the n, for uh, the reference and the environment systems together, uh, then you can pretty easily work out what it looks like. And it, it has this, um, this there are a whole, whole bunch of sums, but the, the main thing that I want you to focus on is that there are essentially two types of uh, terms inside these sums, ones which involve overlaps of black hole states, which are written in black, and then all of the information or all of the data about the quantum channel um, can essentially be sort of uh, repackaged in the form of a particular tensor, which I'm calling F here. Uh, and this F is some, again, as I said, this F tensor is, is, is just is, is a tensor which sort of uh, nicely packages together all of the, uh, all of the data uh, about uh, the quantum channel, the, the error channel E. You can also, you can visualize if you like this, uh, this F tensor in terms of a tensor network. Um, which, uh, which, which I've tried to draw here. Uh, and then sort of the, the, on the right-hand side of the spectra, you see these black lines are essentially these uh, overlaps of um, these, these overlaps of black hole states. Um, and the, 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 this blue tensor, the F tensor, which includes all of the data about the, the quantum channel E is then glommed on um, to, this, uh, to the, to the, uh, to the, to the, uh, to the picture if you like. Okay, so the idea is basically to compute the, the overlaps, the black hole overlap, the, the overlaps of black hole states uh, by using JT gravity, and then glom on this tensor network coming from the uh, quantum channel E, uh, and then perform the sums. So that's the, the general strategy. Um, but uh, the, the one caveat or the one remark that I should make about uh, about this calculation is that we are assuming here that this F tensor, which remember had um, had all of the um, so this F tensor, which had all of the data of the the quantum channel E, uh, we are assuming that that does not contain any additional uh, black hole microstate overlaps within it. Okay, because if it did, then it would source additional asymptotic boundaries in in our calculation and would lead to other interesting gravitational saddles. So an example of this type of thing uh, failing is when the, the channel that you're considering makes use of something like the PETS operator, the PETS operator reconstruction uh, in the interior of the bars, okay? Because that uh, the PETS operator reconstruction uses, uh, uses these, um, uh, basically introduces additional asymptotic boundaries uh, in, in your calculation. Um, but 
on, on the other hand, you know, if you uh, something like the PETS operator reconstruction is a very uh, highly fine uh, fine tuned quantum channel, which would need access uh, sort of to the details of black hole microstate overlaps. And so, at, at least as long as um, at least as long as the quantum channel E is fairly generic and does not have access to black hole microstate overlaps, uh, then then this uh, assumption is is a reasonable one. So having said that, um, we we can now go ahead and compute um, the various. So for example, we were we were looking at the computation of this particular trace of rho prime to the n for the reference and the environment uh, factors. Um, so it's now pretty easy to like go ahead and compute these things. The for example, if the the fully disconnected geometry is accounted for in this computation, um, then you can easily convince yourself by um, doing these various sums that you, you find an answer like this, where uh, the, the DI is, is the dimension of the interior uh, code subspace, DE is the dimension of the exterior code subspace. Um, and this particular factor here is, is packaging for you all of the, the, um, the content or the, all of the information of the quantum channel, or all, of, all of the contribution of the quantum channel. Um, in particular, the sigma environment is, is a particular density matrix uh, what it is, is that it's essentially you take the maximally mixed state on the bar uh, and act on that with the quantum channel um, and then ask what is the output density matrix on the environment. So the trace of the nth power of that is what appears in this particular computation. So this, this, last, this last piece here is where all of the, uh, the contribution of the quantum channel is and all of the contribution from the black hole uh, is or the code subspace is distilled out in these two terms. So, so one more, yeah. one just one quick yes, yes. clarification. Yes. So in um, so in when you if there then there is an answer. So you, you know your original statement was about uh, this uh, quantum error correction type of statement was about uh, uh, you know pure states. So when you have an ensemble average that you know some it's it's acting in the it's in the case right in the in increasing the k at each step or something like that that's the place where the ensemble averaging of the hamiltonians will go in because a unitary is acting on the the radiation and the some auxiliary system or something right that's right so what we are doing is we are essentially computing the on you're completely right we are computing we want to compute this mutual information mm -hmm. but we are computing the so the mutual information is some number and then we are in using jt gravity implicitly sort of assuming that we compute the ensemble average of this particular mutual information. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you for that question. Um, so that is the contribution from the fully disconnected geometry. Um, so you can also similarly go ahead and compute the other terms in the Rennie mutual information uh, by 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 similarly like. Con considering disconnected geometries and performing all of the index contractions. I won't go through the details of that, but the upshot of this calculation is that what you find is that the Rennie mutual information uh, coming from the disconnected contribution simply vanishes. Okay. Um, more precisely, I should say that this Rennie mutual information is exponentially small because there are other um, subleading saddles which are suppressed in the entropy. Um, um, but if you just focus on the disconnected saddle, then you find a, a, a vanishing mutual information. And so you would conclude that these, this particular error is correctable uh, on the uh, interior of the black hole. Uh, but, but you have to be a bit careful and you also need to consider um, other, like for, for example, the fully connected contribution um, to this, to this uh, particular mutual information. Um, the, 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 ca the calculation for the fully connected saddle is a little bit dif difficult at general n, but we can always work um, at n close to one and then um, uh, take the n going to um, uh, one limit uh, using the lukovitz maldacena trick. So that computation seems, it, it, it turns out to be more tractable. Um, and so what you find when you do the computation using the fully uh, connected, uh, oh, sorry, this is a typo. This should say fully connected geometry. So when you uh, com compute the uh, contribution to the mutual information coming from the fully connected geometry, um, what, you find, uh, what you find is that uh, that mutual information is non-vanishing. In particular, you get twice uh, the log of the interior dimension. Um, 
And uh, one thing that I should point out in these various formulae is that it, they again have a very similar structure, namely that there are these factors which come from the black hole um, space time and the code subspace. And then there is a factor which sort of encodes all of the information about the quantum channel. Uh, so in this case, uh, the density matrix sigma that appears is uh, again, very similar. You feed the maximally mixed state uh, into the quantum channel, and then you read out the state on the bar. Okay, so essentially it's the sort of output state uh, you get when you act on the, on, on the maximally mixed state with this quantum channel, that is sigma r. So in this case, uh, all of the contribution from the channel is packaged neatly in terms of the sigma r. So the upshot is, so the one last thing that we need to check is when, when is one or, one, one or the other saddle uh, uh, more relevant? So it turns out that uh, this question, at least in the end going to one limit, can be, can, has a nice answer. So it turns out that um, when this particular combination of the entropies of sigma r minus sigma environment uh, is much, much greater than minus the black hole entropy, um, then um, the uh, interior is protected uh, from this uh, quantum channel E. So in other words, when this, when this condition is satisfied, uh, the disconnected geometry will dominate over the connected one and the error will be protect, uh, recoverable, okay? So this, this particular quantity on the left-hand side is what in quantum information theory is called the coherent information of this quantum channel E uh, with respect to the maximally mixed state, okay? So we learned that it's, it, you can think of this coherent information as some sort of a measure for how noisy uh, the quantum channel E is. And the black hole entropy provides a lower bound for how noisy it can be uh, until the interior of the uh, black hole uh, gets corrupted by this quantum channel. Um, so this is what I just said. Um, now, so far, I just con considered like the contribution of the fully connected and the fully disconnected saddles. But at least for simple uh, errors like erasure errors, um, one can actually also resum a whole bunch of planar geometries using the Schwinger-Dyson trick. Uh, I don't have the time to go through the details of that calculation, but you can uh, pretty, pretty easily show um, that when you do that, then the mutual information, um, these Jenny mutual informations rather, uh, have a nice uh, smooth transition from the, the, um, the answer for the disconnected saddle uh, to the answer for the connected saddle uh, with some smooth transition in between. So let me uh, conclude uh, with some final remarks. Um, so in the black hole interior, what we've found is that there is a sort of more robust version of quantum error correction, uh, where even errors acting on the bath or the, or the radiation uh, can be the, are, are sort of uh, recoverable or are the, the, the black hole interior uh, after the page time is protected against even a, a large class of errors acting on um, the bath. Uh, the, the sort of properties that, or the kind of channels that are protected uh, should not have, or, or do not have access to the detailed um, details of black hole microstates or their uh, statistics, and have this other property that they shouldn't be too noisy um, and sort of, sort of have this um, bound on how uh, negative their coherent information can be. Um, and one last comment is that we expect this robust form of quantum error correction to also generalize to a sort of more general entanglement better reconstruction uh, setup where uh, you know the regions of the entanglement wedge which are behind uh, non-minimal quantum extremal surfaces these so-called python sludge portions of entanglement wedges um, we expect that they should also have this sort of robust form of quantum error correction uh, but that is currently under investigation uh, but so, but I'll just so I'll just leave that as, as a remark uh, for now. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Omkar. So yes, uh, two quick questions, maybe Somdatta. Yeah. So uh, going back to the question that I was asking, uh, when you are saying that the environment channel can be uh, invoked by uh, pure states, uh, I would guess that if you say suppose you exchange something with the environment is going to not remain the same state, right? Yes. So then how can you say that it, it can be invoked by a pure state? Uh, 
So what I said was that the, so you bring in the environment in some auxiliary state and then couple it to your original density matrix. What you, the, the, the state that you bring in, uh, see the initial state of the environment, which is brought in, in, some, in this, the, that, that auxiliary state e is what I was saying can be always taken to be pure by a choice of what you mean by the environment. So what happens after the coupling is turned on is, is just completely up for grabs. I mean, that, that depends on the specifics of the channel, the specifics of the coupling and so on. So you take that into account? Yes. Okay. Alok? Uh, hi, hi, Ankar. So, hi. Uh, so the original, this quantum error correction, I mean, the, the simple way to understand it was like subregion, subregion duality, right? Yes. Uh, yes. So is it is it correct to say that the your, the main message of your talk is that if we have this new, uh, you know, QVS where the island moves in the entanglement wedge, then the, there is a subregion, subregion duality that can be now implemented via some logical, op I mean, so, so the same thing holds, but now with this new entanglement wedge with the um, island actually, just moves in. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, I think it's a little, it's more than that. I mean, the subregion, subregion duality in this case would say that the island is encoded in the radiation and therefore mm -hmm. is protected from errors on the dual quantum, the, you know, the quantum system B that's dual to the black hole. Uh, okay. That's of course very easy to check in this case. And that's mm -hmm. absolutely true. Uh, but what I was focusing on was a, a sort of more robust form of error correction, where even when the island is in the entanglement wedge of the bar, there is a class of errors on the bar. Okay, additional in, errors. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. There are more, there are, it's sort of more robust because there is a class of errors on the bar itself, which yeah. are, uh, you know, protected against. So that, that's yes, the kind yes. of thing I was, I was. Yeah, yeah. But certainly, as you're saying, it's true that they are protected against the errors in the CFT. Uh, yes, uh, that's, e that's easy to show. That's easy to check. But then your last statement was that, so is it, I mean, is a corollary of your result that the, there are the some some interior operators which we can reconstruct through this, and they are independent of the microstate geometries. I mean, you know, the, as you were saying that these uh, uh, recoverable channels are you know independent of the microstates of the black hole, right? So, uh, I, I was asking in the context of the mirror operator construction of cigarette and others, where you know, the, it seemed like you would need the knowledge of the microstates, right? In, in that that's, case, yeah. that's right. So operator reconstruction usually does require um, a detailed, uh, detailed knowledge of black hole microstates. What I was saying was that the kind of channels which are, uh, which this encoding is robust against do not have this, uh, are ones which do not have access to black hole microstate detail. I see, but they, they are, they are also some operators. Yeah. I mean, could I not think of them as operators in the bulk or do you think that's not the right way to uh, yeah, think of so, them? Uh, Hmm. I think I, they are in, exactly. So I, I think they do not. So these kind of channels are sort of fairly generic and they, because they don't have access to black hole microstate statistics, they don't like introduce excitations in the interior of the black hole. I see. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Omkar, thanks for a very nice talk. Uh, I have a feeling I have not understood one of the key points you were trying to make. So let me ask you, sure. which is, was there a sense in which the errors are, are better protected in the radiation than if we were just trying to reconstruct the bulk from the boundary in, in just standard ADS-CFT yes. quantum error correction? And, and yes. what is that sense? I didn't yeah. understand. So that. for example, if you just have the you know, ordinary, you say, say you're in vacuum ADS, mm -hmm. uh, then again, if you have a boundary subregion A, then there's a bulk entanglement wedge. That's mm -hmm. equal to it. Let's say it's just some interval in ADS3, right? Or ADS mm -hmm. uh, CFT2. Um, in that case, uh, this, this doesn't work. So the code, uh, code subspace degrees or like interior degrees of freedom in that entanglement mm -hmm. are not robustly protected against generic channels acting on the boundary. This is very easy to show. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not a surprise because, you know, um, the, in that context, this, the, what, what is true there is that errors acting on A bar um, are robustly protected against. But here, what is happening is that um, you have a slightly more robust version of quantum error correction because the, the entanglement wedge lies behind a non-minimal QES. Mm -hmm. So it's a slight, so it's like, it's a, yeah. So there, there's a different uh, flavor to this kind of um, entanglement wedge. Um, and that's what gives rise to, 
in my opinion, that's what gives rise to this more robust version of quantum mechanics. I see, I see. But but then just to ask, I mean, in the standard ADS situation, you are protected against erasures of a bar, of a bar, but not on. So generic errors on A will will not be protected against, and will. And, and I see, and here uh, even fairly generic errors in the radiation pro are protected against, huh? That's right. As long as they they are not fine tuned and uh, they're not very noisy, mm -hmm. where the noise is characterized by this black hole entropy. Mm, I see. Okay, thanks a lot. Sure. Thank you. One last question. Uh, maybe okay, two. Deepan, quick question. Yes, sir. So, in, in 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 the case of binary black holes, if if, if the interior in the, if the if the interiors of the two black holes interact, then how will the how will the how will the error condition be modified? Um, so, if I understood the question correctly, you you want to have like a a, um, a thermophile double kind of setting, like where you have a, an entangled pair of black holes. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, that's a good question. Um, that, that's that's a good question. I, I think that there is a sim that you should be able to construct a similar um, uh, a similar uh, bound of the uh, on the on the so in that context, I suppose you want the the error channel to act on one of the black holes and ask yes. whether that um, is um, so. Um, hmm. So in that so the one difference in that context is that there is. Um, at least if the entanglement between the two black holes is sufficiently uh, simple, then you don't have, um, you, you, you won't have, like in the simplest case, you won't have a Python's lunch. So you, you might not have a very, like this kind of robust form of quantum error correction. Um, but on the other hand, if the, the entanglement is generic and you, you, have, um, you have some kind of a Python's lunch portion for the, um, for the dual geometry, then I would expect that there is a similarly similar robust form of quantum error correction inside only in the Python's lunch portion of the geometry. Uh, that would be my guess, but I'd have to think more about your question. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. One last question, Abhijit. Yes, uh, thank you, Anirban. Thanks, thanks, Sankar, for a wonderful talk. Just to put this in, I mean, just to see whether I understand the context. So, uh, is it true that a uh, more uh, traditional understanding of the black hole uh, of the Hilbert space uh, corresponding to this picture, uh, you know, going back to Hawking, would have told you that this is uh, protected, right? The error should be protected, right? Which is reflected in the fact that the disconnected geometry dominates. Yeah. Now, with the newer understanding, uh, you re you see that uh, there is a there is a there is a uh, possibility that the errors may not be protected. And you find the precise condition for which that is the case. In particular, the the properties of the channel for which uh, the errors are not protected, right? Uh, that's right. That's so. That's one way of saying it. But what I would have the slightly different way of putting it is that um, the, the the new thing as compared to Hawking is the understanding that the island portion of the black hole space time is now in the entanglement wedge of the bar after the page time, right? So that is that is the first step of where the novelty or the departure from Hawking comes in. Uh, but what we are finding is that even so, um, you know, so you might be a little bit uncomfortable with this the statement because it seems like you know if it, it might seem like it sort of sort of blatantly violates the causal structure of space time. But what we are saying is that our finding is that um, you know the the this encoding is somehow surprisingly robust and not everything or the sort of fairly generic things that you do on the bar mm -hmm. uh, do not affect the excitations deep in the interior of the black hole. So it's that the, the robustness of the encoding, mm -hmm. uh, th that sort of robustness of the encoding is what, what we are trying to capture. I see. So even after page time, when it is even after page page. Wedge, you would have naively thought that uh, the errors would not be protected. Yes. So that's another kind of way of looking at it. I see. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I guess that's it for the, the morning session. Thanks to all the speakers. So we will continue with questions in the discussion session, right? So Alok, maybe. Uh, yeah, to so, uh, so today, uh, despite starting on time, uh, as expected, we are uh, a half hour behind schedule again. So no surprise, I mean, uh, the nature of the talks and discussions are always welcome. Now I see Yuji is on board. Uh, Yuji, uh, uh, are you there? Yes. Oh, great. So do we have your permission to, uh, uh, because 
uh, yeah, yeah, let's take a, a break. Yes, so we uh, like we can have a shorter 15-minute uh, break and reconvene at 11.45. Will that work yeah, for you? That, yeah, that's fine. Okay, cool. So, Shupriyo, are you there, the, uh, the, uh, the chair of the next session? Yes, I'm there. Oh, lovely. So, uh, I apologize, Devashish. Uh, we are not able to follow uh, what you had... Uh, Asked should be done. Uh, I pray at some point uh, in the remainder of this conference, we would be able to actually have a tea break of the duration advertised. However, uh, respecting and following and being educated by Arnab Rudra's suggestion, our team has uh, come up with five gather town uh, ice and lounges, each uh, which can accommodate 25 folks. I've already shared the links, uh, the chat, email, etc. So. Uh, please explore. Uh, it seems to be uh, an interesting, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, meeting uh, place. Uh, so please enjoy and we reconvene in, uh, in uh, 15 minus four minutes. Thank you. All right.
Hi, EG. Hello. Hi. So, uh, apologies for uh, the delay. Um, no problem. How, how is the pandemic situation there in Tokyo? Um, here, it was rather bad uh, until late August, but somehow COVID kind of disappeared for no apparent reason. So everybody really? is, yeah, it's, it, it's almost at the level of the very beginning of the pandemic. We just don't know why. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so, so we were perplexed because nobody knows the answer. Um, we don't know what will happen, for example, when Omicron comes. Mm -hmm. so, so we are totally at a loss. That's so uh, have, you guys, have you guys been vaccinated? Uh... Uh, we are about 80% uh, vaccinated, so that's playing a role. Yeah, but, you know, Canada is vaccinated about the same rate, but they have a rather high case rate. And similarly, Korea, South Korea, just beside us, has a similar or even higher vaccination rate and okay. still has the rather big peak right now. I see. Yeah. At the I moment, see. the media says that the Korean uh, hospitals are flooded by the patients. Ah, okay. Yeah, with almost all of the ICU beds uh, taken. So oh. I, I, I believe South Koreans and we Japanese behave rather similarly, you know, in the public space. Okay. So, okay. so the behavior is not really the... I mean, human behavior does not seem to be the reason behind our sudden drop in the case numbers in the last few months. So we, we are we are kind of co confused. I mean, it's, it's it's nice, right? But still, we are totally confused why it disappeared. So I see. I see. Yeah. So uh, uh, how, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, and I was just uh, curious that. Uh, uh, hi, Sunil. Hi, hi. hi Sunil. So we, we were just curious, like, for example, in India, uh, most folks who have been vaccinated have been double vaccinated. They've received two shots. Uh -huh. I don't think uh, there is anybody or there may be a very tiny fraction who received a third booster shot. So how is it uh, in, in Tokyo or in Japan in general? We haven't started booster vaccination at all. They are debating when to start. Okay. Um, their original idea was to start around February next year, but okay. the government is uh, working very hard to do something faster because of the recent rise of Omicron. Um, okay. But I don't know what will happen. How about the age group? Uh, like, uh, how about uh, kids below 18? Like, for example, in India, uh, I've got kids below 18 and they are not vaccinated. That does make me, frankly, very tense. And now oh, the yeah. schools have actually opened up. They're forcing students to return. Uh, I mean, that, that really drives uh, me and my wife, I mean, crazy, but we don't have a choice. How's, how's it in Tokyo and in Japan again here, in general? Yeah, we don't vaccinate kids either at below 18. Okay. Yeah. So only adults are vaccinated. I don't so know the government's okay. plan. Yeah. So there, there are no uh, trials either which are going on? For, I, I for think kids. the trial is going. They're going on? Okay. Yeah, but uh, there's no general vaccination for kids yet. Okay. Okay. Hello? Okay, I see your chair, uh, Shupriya Kar, is uh, mm -hmm. here. So, yes, I'm here. We can begin in a couple of minutes. Right. So we see your slide, it's good. And you can, I think you can go back and forth, right? You check that. Uh, let me check. Yes, you can see that. Yeah, yeah. Can you see the pointer? Yes, the, the arrow moving over the pictures. Oh, yeah. yes. Good. Great.
Hi, Yuji. How are you? Hi. Hello. Yeah. How are you? Long time. Good, good. Good, good. So are you back in your old department? Uh, you yes, yes. That, is that where you normally sit? Here? Yeah, it's, it's my home in my apartment. No, right now, <laughs> right now we may be at home. I'm saying that, are you back in Hong Kong normally? Um, I'm now in IPMU. Yeah, IPMU is within University of Tokyo, but in fact, it's rather far away oh, from Hong Kong. Yeah, long time ago, as you know, I was in Hong Kong. I uh -huh. actually live close to Hong Kong, but I take about a one hour, uh, one hour and a half train ride to go to IPMU. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're not associated with uh, Hong Kong anymore. You're not teaching there. Uh, no, not really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm mainly affiliated to the institute and not to the Department of Physics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's only Matsuo san uh, uh, there. I'm a four strength list. Mm -hmm. So they didn't get anybody after? Uh, that? Yeah, no, no, not to repla replace me. No. Mm -hmm. Long time no see. <laughs> yeah. 15 years or something. We um, exchanged the email a bit, but. Uh, yes, yes. And thanks for giving your book to us. <laughs> it's an honor. And I guess it's kind of time. Uh, where is you? You, you, Nakayama is now in Rikyo University. It's, it's a university, private university in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. Thank you very much for remembering us. <laughs> when you oh, are no. here, I mean, we, we were students, you know. Thank you very fondly. Hello, shall we start now? Yes. Yes, by all means. Yes, Shabriya, please. Yes. Thank you. So, welcome, Yuzi, to this uh, forenoon session. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, the speaker is Uji Tachikawa, and he will tell us about interligator cyborg duality. Please go ahead. You have uh, 25 minutes for talk and five minutes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, nice conference. So today I'd like to talk about uh, how to match uh, higher symmetries across interligator cyborg duality. So this work is done in collaboration with two fantastic colleagues of mine, uh, Yasunori Lee and Kantaro Omori. So Kantaro Omori was in United States for a while and he's now back in Hong Kong as an assistant professor. Yasunori Lee is my student and he's applying this year. Uh, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. So uh, please understand what I mean by that. Yes. Okay, so uh, what we did was to study uh, higher symmetries. So these are one form of symmetries, two groups and their anomalies and how they match across a certain four-dimensional uh, n equals one supersymmetric duality originally found by Intrigate and Zyberg. So that's just a standard Zyberg duality between SO uh, gauge group with a sub number of flavors. So when the flavor is 2NF, then the number of colors is changed to from 2NC to 2NF minus 2NC plus four. So that's found long time ago. So we are revisiting this old duality from a new point of view. So that's what we did. So let me begin by reminding you about higher symmetries. Uh, P-form symmetry uh, is a kind of a symmetry, generalized type of symmetry, which acts on P-dimensional objects. So zero-form symmetry is the ordinary symmetry, and they are carried by, I mean, the charges under zero form symmetries are carried by a zero dimensional operator, so at point operators. And in four dimensions, in four space time dimensions, you can consider a three dimensional wall, uh, which implements a group operation G. So when you cross, when, the, when an operator, point operator crosses this wall, uh, you get an action of G upon the operator O. So that's the ordinary symmetry. Now you can consider a higher symmetry, which is a 
uh, for example, let's consider one form of symmetry. So that's carried by a line operator, such as Wilson lines and Tohoff lines. And in that case, group operation is performed by a two-dimensional surface. And if you cross, if a line operator cross uh, such a two-dimensional wall, then a certain operation is done. So that's how one form of symmetry operator acts on lines charged under one form of symmetry. So uh, this was formulated uh, nicely by Guy Otto Kapus and Zabin in 2014. So let's have an example. So you consider pure SO2N gauge theory. And it, this system has uh, two one form symmetries. One one form symmetry is electric Z to one form symmetry. So in that case, the charged objects are Wilson lines. And uh, there is an element minus one, diagonal uh, matrix minus one in SO2N. And it can act either as plus one or minus one on a representation R of SO2N. So Wilson lines in a representation such that the minus one of SO2N acts as minus one has a charge, well, minus one, well, charge uh, one. Uh, if we use additive normalization. So that's the electric one form symmetry. On the other hand, uh, magnetic uh, Z2 one form symmetry is carried by Tohoft loops, Tohoft lines in uh, SO gauge theory. So the Z2 charge can be measured by integrating the Stiefel Fitney class of uh, the sphere surrounding the line. So this Stiefel Fitney class controls whether a SO2 end gauge bundle can be lifted to spin to end bundle or not. So let's play some game using this one form symmetry. So SO2 in theory has this magnetic Z2 one form symmetry, which I, as I said, measures this uh, studio fitting class. So let's gauge this Z2 one form symmetry. So if you gauge a symmetry, charged operators disappear. This means that charged lines with non-zero Stiefel fitting class disappear. This means that uh, by definition of the Stiefel Pitney class, all configurations, all gauge configurations in such a gauged theory is in fact liftable to spin 2n. Therefore, it essentially becomes spin 2n theory. Now, let's next consider a pure spin 2n theory. Uh, and this has, theory has a center symmetry. So that's a type of one form symmetry, and that's given by Z2 type Z2 when n is even. So when 2n is a multiple of four, and it's given by Z4 when uh, n is odd. So what does it mean? So this is because uh, if you can consider Wilson line in a spin representation, and you take two Wilson lines in the spin representation, you take the product. When n is even, spin type spin contains a singlet, while uh, when n is odd, spin time spin contains vector representation. Because of that, spin generates Z2 subgroup in the n even case, but spin generates a Z4, the entire Z4 in the vector case. So that's why the parity of n affects the center of spin to n. I have a so, question. Yes, please. So why are they called one form symmetries? What is the origin of the one form business? Uh, I don't like this name either. <laughs> um, so when you consider continuous symmetry, such as U1 symmetry, then the background field for one form symmetry or zero form symmetry uh, corresponds to formal fields, right? So differential forms can, can be classified into zero form, one form, two form, etc. So that's the origin of the this strange uh, terminology p form symmetry. I, I prefer just calling them p symmetries. But but so the U, I mean, U, you ordinary u one symmetry would be a zero form symmetry, or that's right, that's right. Ordinary symmetries are zero form. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Ah. Okay. So let me summarize what I told you. So I was just reviewing one form symmetries. Um, so in the SO2N symmetry, sorry, SO2N gauge theory, the one form symmetries are either Z2 times Z2, I mean, always Z2 times Z2. In the case of spin 2N theory, 
is the one form symmetry is z2 times z2 or z4, right? And uh, these two setups are exchanged uh, by gauging z2. So as I, I, as I explained, when the z2 one form symmetry was gauged in SO2 and uh, gauge theory, uh, you get spin 2 and theory. So these four cases are related to each other. I didn't have time to explain that uh, Z2 times Z2 one form symmetry of SO2N gauge theory, uh, in fact, has a different anomaly depending on whether N is even or odd. Uh, but that's something uh, you might want to know. So that's what I re reviewed about one form symmetry. Let's move on to a more complicated type of higher symmetry, which is a, called two group, right? So we know that zero form symmetry or ordinary symmetry can be extended, right? So G is a symmetry group, H is a symmetry group, and it can have a non-trivial extension. Um, now, we now know that one form symmetry and zero form symmetry can also mix into a more complicated object. So zero form symmetry can be extended by a one form symmetry to uh, become something more intricate. People call it two groups. Again, that's a convention, unfortunately. I don't know why this is not called one group, but people decided to call it two groups. So the 4D gauge theory example with non-trivial two group symmetry was first found by uh, Poshen Shin and Hot Lan last summer. So let me describe this example. So we just consider spin two and gauge theory, just like before, but we add uh, two NF flavors of scalar fields in the vector representation. So it has SU two NF flavor symmetry, right? What's the one form of symmetry? So one form of symmetry is carried by line operators, Wilson lines, and as I said, spin. Uh, center of the spin group is either z2 times z2 or z4, right? So in particular, I said that spinner times spinner becomes a vector in the latter case when n is odd. But here we are introducing a dynamical matter fields in the vector representation of the gauge field. So this resulting Wilson line in the vector, rep vector representation can be screened by dynamical particles in the vector representation. So this is essentially trivial. This means that uh, at this level of neglecting the flavor symmetry, um, the remaining one form of symmetry is just Z2 because Wilson lines in the vector representation is screened in any case. However, things become more interesting if you remember the existence of flavor symmetry. That is because of the following. You see, you have a vector representation Wilson line, and you try to screen it by using the dynamical particle, which has vector representation under the gauge group. But the only dynamical field uh, is just a vector, is just a scalar field in the vector representation of the gauge theory, but in the uh, fundamental representation of the flavor symmetry. Therefore, you always have a fundamental charge. So what happens is that, uh, what happens is that when NC is odd, you start by thinking what happens if you take two co copies of Wilson lines is a spinner representation. This essentially becomes vector representation Wilson line, and you try to screen it by dynamical particle. But that process inevitably assigns a flavor fundamental representation to the line operator. Therefore, you can still distinguish uh, the Wilson line in the vector representation even after taking into account the screening by the dynamical particle by just looking at the flavor symmetry. So this means that uh, one form of symmetry and zero form of symmetry are intrinsically mixed when NC is odd, while 
it is still separate when NC is even. So such a mixture of one form of symmetry and zero form of symmetry is called two groups, as I said. So formalizing it mathematically is a bit tiresome, but let me try using just the one single slide. So you see, start, we start from SC2 and F flavor symmetry. So that's an ordinary zero form symmetry. But suppose you kind of gauge, then you still can consider a center symmetry of coming from that center of SC2 and F. So let's just take Z2 subgroup of that center. Under that Z2 subgroup, uh, which is generated by just minus one in SC2 and F, then the <coughs> flavor fundamental Wilson line is still charged under the <laughs> this flavor Z2 one form symmetry. So what happens in this gauge theory example is that uh, flavor, I mean, electric Z2 one form symmetry and flavor Z2 one form symmetry extracted from flavor zero form symmetry are uh, mixed and becomes Z4 in the case NC is odd, while they remain separate when NC is even. So that's how uh, ordinary symmetry, zero form symmetry, and the one form symmetry are mixed in this example. Right. So, so far I didn't consider any supersymmetry. So let's try to mix in the integrator Zyberg duality. So that was a duality found in 1995 between four dimensional uh, n equals one gauge theory, n equals one supersymmetry gauge theory with uh, SO 2NC a gauge group with 2NF flavors and the dual is this. So there are many checks of the duality in the past 25 years. There are many checks. Zero form symmetries match, a normally polynomial match, super conformal index match. So you want to ask how about the global form of the gauge group or about two groups, right? So an early work right after the original paper by Intrigator and Zyberg by Mark Strassler suggested that SO group and SPIN group were exchanged under the duality. That didn't quite uncover the whole story. Um, so what he did was to consider a duality, more sophisticated duality with dynamical quarks in the spinner representation. But here you can take the decoupling limit. So, and you can try to understand what is going on by studying how duality acts on the line operators. So that was done in my paper with Aharoni and Zyber in uh, 2013. So what that shows is that there are in fact three types of SOQCD. One is a spin gauge theory, another is a SO plus gauge theory, and the final one is the SO minus gauge theory. So the spin theory has a Wilson line, SO plus theory has a Tohoft line, and SO minus theory has a mixture of them, so that it has a dionic line. So that's the distinction. And as a duality, Higgs vacua and confined vacua are exchanged. And in the Higgs vacua, uh, Wilson line have perimeter law, Tohoft line have area law, and dionic line have area law. In the confined vacua, we have area law for the Wilson line. And uh, because in the integrated type of duality, uh, there's an oblique confinement in the, instead of the standard confinement. Therefore, the whole line still has area law, while dionic line has perimeter law. This means that three choices are interchanged in this way under the duality. So summarizing, if we are careful about the global structure of the gauge group, uh, the integrated Zyberg duality acts in this way. SO plus is mapped to SO plus, while spin theory and SO minus theory are exchanged. So this was tested by superconformal index using uh, using superconformal index uh, by Razamat and Villet. So it, this paper is very nice because it has mathematical notebook where you can just plug in NC and NF and compute long expressions and you can directly see that the duality works. So 
the question today is whether the two group structure agree or not. <clears throat> so let's come to the uh, crucial point. So how does the higher symmetry act across duality? To do that, we need to remind, <laughs> excuse me, what happens in the case of spin 2N theory with 2NF flavors. So in fact, we already saw what happens in this case, because uh, the example by uh, Singh and Lam was with uh, matter fields in the scalar, uh, sorry, ma matter, scalar matter fields. But here we are putting both fermion fields and scalar fields, but essentially the argument is the same. So to see whether the symmetry, one form symmetry and zero form symmetry combines, what you do is to take two Wilson lines, non-trivial Wilson lines, combine them, and to see if the resulting line is non-trivial under the flavor symmetry. So let's do that again. So we start from a gauge spinner Wilson line. You take the two of them and fuse them. So you take the tensor product of the representations. In one case, you get the gauge singlet, so that's when NC is even. But when NC is odd, you get the gauge vector representation. Now you can try to screen it by the dynamical uh, field, which is charged under the vector representation of spin group and the fundamental representation of the flavor group. So in this case, uh, we see that the one form of symmetry, Z to one form of symmetry of spin to NC theory is mixed non-trivially with the flavor symmetry. So we find that when NC is even, zero form and one form symmetries remain direct product, while when NC is odd, they form non-trivial two group, right? So, so far we get this result. You see, what we want to know is how the two group structure matches across the Zyberg duality. So I there are question. three choices. Yes, please. When you say gauge spinner Wilson line, do you mean that when you evaluate the Wilson line, you get a spinner or something? Ah. Is that what I, you're I, saying? Uh, what I'm saying is that you can consider Wilson lines in various representations, right? You just insert uh, Wilson line operator in your path integral, right? But yeah. you can use fundamental representation or vector representation or spinner representation when you take the trace. So that's just what gauge spinner represent, spinner Wilson line means. Oh, okay. okay fine. Yeah. So you just insert a trace over the spin representation of yeah, your when you have the spin representation, I guess you have the gamma matrices uh, in the in the matrices, right? You have the yeah, 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 spinner. right, right. Ga yeah. But that spinner is the spinner of the a gauge group, not the space time. So that's yeah, the confusing yeah, yeah. part. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah, sure. All right. So uh, what what I said is that. Uh, one form and zero form remain just a direct product when NC is even. And when NC is odd, they form a non-trivial two group. So we filled in this, these portions of the entries. And the intricated Zyberg duality acts as this and exchanges spin and SO minus and keeps SO plus. That's complicated, so I just drew it for you. So the duality acts in this way. So what we want to do is to fill in the other entries, right? And to see whether it is compatible with the two group structure. So we need to understand the two group structure in the SO2 and C theory. So how do we do that? What we do is simple. Um, again, all we have to do is to take the product of two non-trivial line operators and to see whether you have a non-trivial flavor charge after the dynamical screen. So let's 
start by forgetting about the flavors image, right? So what we do is to start from a charge one to Hoch line, which is non-trivial. You take the two, you fuse them. So you get the single to Hoch line, but with magnetic charge two. It has the same magnetic charge as a dynamical monopole in this theory. Therefore, it can be screened and it becomes a trivial line. As long as you forget about neglect the flavors image. But the important point is that the dynamical monopole can have non-trivial uh, flavor charge. Therefore, uh, Z to one form symmetry of SO theory and the flavor zero form symmetry uh, remain a direct product or are combined into a non-trivial two group, depending on whether the dynamical monopole has charge plus one or charge minus one under uh, the minus one of the flavor symmetry SU2 and F. So that's what you have to study. So the point is that there can be pheromonic zero modes on dynamical monopoles, which can potentially induce flavor charge on the monopoles. So a famous example of that is N equals two supersymmetric SU2 theory with NF flavors, originally studied by Zyberg and Witten. So in that case, each monopole carries pheromonic zero modes, uh, one from each flavor. So it, it, it's a zero mode of psi where I runs from one to two NF. And they are quantized into uh, anti-commuting operators. Therefore, it behaves as gamma matrices of the flavor symmetry, uh, which in the N equals two supersymmetric case is just SO. Therefore, the monopole transform in the spinner of the flavor symmetry. So that fact played a rather important role in the original development of the zyberg witten theory. And our situation is similar. So, the entire question now boiled down to the following. In the SO2MC theory with 2NF flavors, how do dynamical monopoles transform under the minus one uh, element, the center element of the flavor symmetry? The way to answer it is quite fun in itself, but I cannot go into detail. I don't have time. And also, such a computation. Uh, I mean, the way to do the, such a computation was developed a long time ago, uh, in the 80s, I think. So if you are doing this business for long enough, this is something uh, you can do by just looking up all the papers. So I can summarize it in one page. So uh, non abelian theory itself is rather hard to analyze. So you add some scalar fields to break the gauge group SO2 and C to SO2 to power NC by introducing adjoint scalar and giving a generic VEV. So you just have Tohoch to Polyak monopole whose zero modes can be found by Cadias index theorem. And the result is that the flavor charge of the monopole is minus one to the NF in the SO2 NC plus theory and minus one to the power NF plus NC for the SO2 NC minus theory. As I told you, this determines whether zero form and one form remains direct product or they become non-trivial two group. So I, I already told you this entry for spin gauge theory. And in the SO plus gauge theory, as I said, oops, it depends on just NF, right? Therefore, when NF is odd, you have two group. And in the case of SO minus theory, the result depends on NF plus NC. So when the sum of NAC and NF is odd, you get two non-trivial two group, and otherwise you have to product. So do they match nice? Do they map nicely under the duality? Yes, this is how the duality is supposed to act. And two group are mapped to two group. Two group are always mapped to two group, and direct product are mapped to direct product. So everything is going all right. So let me summarize. So I just reviewed one form of symmetries and also two groups. And we studied them in the case of SO2NC gauge theory with two NF family on flavors. And they are mapped as expected under the integrated Zyberg duality. I only had time to explain how symmetries match and not how the anomalies of these symmetries match. Actually, the anomalies also match. And if you're interested, you can have a look at our paper. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yuzi, for the nice talk. We mm -hmm. have time for a couple of short questions. 
Yes, please. Uh, hi, I have a question. Yes, um, please. So uh, you spoke of one form symmetries, uh, right? So yes. uh, zero form symmetries, I, mean, I, I know at least in two dimensions, like one has uh, top uh, topological defects, which are uh, non-invertible. Uh, so, right. so this one form symmetry, non-invertible version that in these theories, and, uh, can they be studied similarly? Uh, I think you can. Um, I don't know of any uh, non-invertible one-form symmetry operator in four-dimensional theory. At least in my example, uh, all mm -hmm. symmetries are invertible symmetries. Uh, so far, non-invertible symmetries are mainly studied in two dimensions. Yeah, right. Very recently, there are a few non-trivial, sorry, non-invertible symmetries studied in higher dimensions, yeah. but I think they are all zero form symmetries. So it will be very interesting to study uh, non-invertible one form symmetries. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Izzy, for the uh, exceptionally good talk. And uh, thank you very much. Okay, this is time to move on to the second talk of this session. Speaker is Sudip Karan. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes. Okay, I'm sharing my screen. Okay. Sudip, we have 15 minutes. So restrict your talk to 12 minutes and three minutes for discussion. Okay. Okay, my screen is visible to her? Yes. Okay. What on Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. So what I'm going to talk about is the logarithmic correction to the entropy of extremal core Newman family of black holes in a different super gravity theories. So this work was done in collaboration with my PhD supervisor, Binata Panda, and based on this uh, following article written on this slide. Okay, so uh, first I'm going to introduce the uh, logarithmic correction to black hole entropy. From the uh, seminal works of Bekenstein and Hawking, it is uh, well known that the entropy of a black hole follows an area law described by this uh, famous Bekenstein Hawking formula, which uh, reads as the horizon area of the black hole, this H over uh, four times uh, Newton's gravitational constant, this GN, in this uh, particular choice of units. Now, we all know that uh, for ordinary thermodynamic objects, the entropy has a, a microscopic explanation by the Boltzmann relation connecting entropy to the logarithm of number of microstates available to that system. Similarly, in string theory, strominger Bhapa followed by many others successfully tested a microscopic explanation of uh, this bekenstein hawking entropy for a particular class of extremal uh, supersymmetric black holes. For these black holes, they have first uh, calculated their entropy using the bekenstein hawking formula. On the other hand, they have counted uh, different uh, number of uh, supersymmetric excitation states uh, of a system of fundamental string objects, mostly the d brains, having the same charges uh, as these black holes, and uh, found a almost perfect agreement. This agreement suggests that a uh, proper understanding of black hole entropy from the low energy gravity side or macroscopic side will uh, serve as a uh, strong but non trivial consistency check for any candidate quantum gravity, including string theory. However, this uh, macroscopic and microscopic correspondence is not uh, exact, rather uh, approximated. This is because 
uh, at least on the macroscopic uh, gravity side, the Wittgenstein Hawking formula is uh, derived inside the framework of uh, general theory of relativity, which is a classical two derivative theory. Hence, a natural question arises whether uh, we can calculate this black hole entropy to better accuracy beyond this uh, Wittgenstein Hawking limit. To answer this question, we need to incorporate uh, appropriate corrections to this formula. And in string theory, this formula can be corrected from uh, two class of sources. Uh, first, the higher derivative corrections uh, arising due to considering different uh, higher curvature term to the classical action and which are completely captured by the wild generalization of the Wittgenstein Hawking formula. On the other hand, we have quantum corrections arising due to considering the quantum gravity effects. The most general quantum corrected formula of black hole entropy can be uh, obtained in this form, where this first term is the Wittgenstein Hawking formula and the remaining terms are different uh, quantum corrections to it. These are basically different order loop corrections. In the third term, uh, the series of corrections proportional to inverse power of horizon area are called the power law corrections, while uh, the second term proportional to logarithm of horizon area with the proportionality constant uh, is uh, known as the logarithmic correction. These logarithmic corrections are our particular interest and uh, they are appear to be a special class of one loop quantum corrections. Now, these uh, log corrections are special in the sense that uh, for macroscopically large black holes, these are the most dominant uh, quantum corrections over the power law corrections. And uh, they are universally appear in the structure of every quantum gravity theory. And most importantly, these log corrections are internally compatible by analyzing only the low energy data, that is massless fluctuations and their coupling to the corresponding black hole background without any particular details about the UV completion of the corresponding theory. So this is all about the motivation behind calculating the log corrections. Now, I'm going to present uh, the log corrections and the relevant strategies, uh, techniques we have used for external Kornman family of black holes uh, for a, a different four dimensional supergravity theories. So for the general setup, uh, we have started with the Euclidean continuation of a four dimensional gravity theory described by this uh, path integral, where this S is the Euclidianized action and this uh, J is the whole field configuration of the theory propagating to the, the space-time geometry disk by the same time, G. Then uh, uh, we can fluctuate all the fields and the, including the metric around an arbitrary classical solution of this theory, this G bar and Xi bar for small quantum fluctuation, this G tilde and Xi tilde. Then uh, one can express the quadratic order fluctuated action of this theory via this uh, standard form uh, written here where uh, this uh, operator lambda is the kinetic differential operator controlling the cor corresponding quadratic fluctuations. Uh, with this form and the heat kernel definition of this operator lambda, the one loop effective action of the theory can be uh, represented by this uh, Swinger D8 proper time representation, where this S is known as the heat kernel parameter, which is actually proper time having dimension of length square, this epsilon is a ultraviolet cutoff on the lower integration limits restricted by the uh, gravitational constant in our, in our choice of units. And the sky is a constant parameter, which is plus one for bosons and minus one for the harmonic fluctuations. The effective action form can be further expanded perturbatically uh, via this uh, silly duty expansion for this small heat kernel parameter is where these coefficients, these uh, expansion coefficients, these A0, A2, A4 are respectively uh, uh, known as the silly duit coefficients. Now, Euclidean gravity approaches are highly successful in evaluating these log corrections by finding the one loop effective action only for massless fluctuation in the corresponding black hole background. If uh, any Euclidean gravity approach uses this particular uh, silly duit expanded form of one loop effective action, then it is found that in the central working formula, only this uh, third silly coefficient, this A4, uh, contributes uh, to the log corrections. So for the fluctuation of any theory, we have to first evaluate this A4 coefficient, and then need to integrate it around the appropriate part of the black hole geometry. 
in our work we have uh, um, particularly focused on only on the xml black holes for that we have used sense quantum entropy function formalism which requires uh, the integration of this a4 coefficient only over the finite part of the near horizon ge geometry uh, structured as a product space of ads2 and a compact space uh, describing the compact or angular coordinates then, i have a question okay can you go back to the previous slide okay so the first two terms a0 and a2 okay uh, if you if you compute uh, those terms uh, if you compute the s integrals okay they would give rise okay. to quartic divergences and quadratic they will also contribute to power law correction there will be no log term because here is a ds by s over sitting here so s independent any term uh, any coefficient uh, involving s independent term will actually contribute the log other parts divergent maybe also also non logarithmic contribution will appear from there yeah they will be non logarithmic but they will be uh, highly divergent so how do okay. you no i am just considering this part because because i am uh, interested for only log logarithmic correction so uh, by putting that i have just extracted only the uh, log part so no so is the understanding that uh, you kind of absorb them in the counter terms or something or you renormalize them away or something because no i, I have i have interpreted no no i have not actually considered them here for for my purpose but i have not thought about that regarding okay so can i proceed yes okay so to calculate this a4 coefficients we have uh, calculate uh, we have used this general heat kernel manual by vasilevi where um, we have to first restructure the, uh, this quadratic order fluctuated action in such a way that this kinetic operator lambda becomes laplace type of this uh, schematic but d is the ordinary covariant derivative uh, uh, forming a contracted laplacian term in the principal kinetic part uh, this i is the identity operator in the corresponding field space and this omega rho p are arbitrary matrices induced from the background metric and fields describing the potential uh, term of this operator form then we have to compare this operator form with a more generalized operator form where the covariant derivative is redefined uh, by connecting the gauge connection between the fluctuations this small omega rho and this capital omega rho sigma is the curvature commutator corresponding to this uh, new covariant derivative is here the actually the effective matrix potential expressed in terms of this matrices omega rho and p then after comparing these two form this 11 and 12 we have to identify this matrices i e e square omega square then evaluate their corresponding traces and we utilizing those data uh, we have to finally use this general formula in order to calculate the a4 coefficient here this r mu nu rho sigma r mu nu and r are respectively the curvature tensor and scalar corresponding to this background metric now uh, the strategy for the extremal core newton core and raised and ostom uh, black holes uh, together they are called the uh, extremal core newton family of black holes they are uh, primarily these black holes are uh, solution general solution of the einstein maxwell theory but we can embed them into the four dimensional supergravity theories uh, so that we can interpret them as a solution of the resultant einstein maxwell uh, supergravity theories and for the fluctuation of such theories uh, it is found that a4 is possible to manage only in terms of uh, background riemann and ricci invariants given by this form and then if we use this particular a4 form in the central working formula of the uh, extremal kornivan family of black holes then we requires the integration limits of these uh, invariants and for extremal black holes uh, extremal kornivan black holes these integration limits are expressed in terms of different black hole parameter via this parameter b prime which is uh, j over mq j is angular momentum m is mass and q is the charge of the uh, back corresponding black hole for extremal raisner nostrum black hole we have to set this parameter b prime tends to zero and for extremal core black hole we have to set this parameter b prime tends to infinity in this uh, core newman limits then with this setup and strategy we have started with a four dimensional uh, n equals to 2 einstein maxwell supergravity theory where the massless fields are distributed into uh, four kind four multiplets this supergravity gravitational vector and hypermultiplet 
and then one can structure a matter couple n equals to two theory by coupling a single uh, supergravity multiplet with arbitrary number of vector and hypermultiplets. From starting with the uh, uh, quadratic order fluctuated action of all these multiplets and following the strategies I have just mentioned, uh, we have successively calculated the solitude coefficient and log correction contributions of all these n equals to two multiplets and then finally obtained the result for this matter couple n equals to two theory. For the uh, remaining n equals to one and all n greater than equals to three theories, we have uh, followed a different treatment. Rather than um, executing any direct calculations, uh, we found that it is possible to uh, decompose a n equals to one theory in terms of different combination of uh, n equals to two multiplets. Similarly, uh, one can decompose the n matter couple n equals n greater than equals to three theories in terms of the n equals to two multiplets given by these equalities. Then utilizing the data we have calculated for the n equals to two multiplets, we solve these equalities and achieve the result for the all these n equals to one and n greater than equals to three theories. These are the corresponding uh, Seeley-Dude coefficient results. The results are expressed in terms of the Riemann and Ricci inference. And utilizing the result, we have calculated actions for external Kornman, Kerr, and Fraser and Mostom black hole. As you can see, that the results follow a particular pattern. For Kornman black holes, the result have a geometric dependence, means depend on different black hole parameter. While the results for Kerr and Fraser and Mostom black holes are just number, they are free from any dependence of black hole parameters and uh, hence they are universal. And all these results may have uh, vital information in understanding the microphysics of the corresponding black holes in future. I think I should stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sudeep. Uh, we can take one or two short questions. Hi, Sudeep. Hello. Yeah, so here uh, you considered uh, logarithmic corrections for large black holes, right? Yes, ma macroscopically large black holes. Yeah, so do you have any idea how to calculate logarithmic corrections for small black holes? I mean, small black holes are basically their classical event horizon area vanishes. So, okay. For that case, uh, log corrections will be least dominant than our logarithmic corrections will be more dominant. That is the main specialty of log correction. Even if you require uh, quantum corrections uh, in terms of log, you have to consider the uh, large charge limit because only then uh, you can neglect the other uh, power law corrections, which requires the also requires the UV details of the theory. But here, the basic uh, fact is to consider log correction because they are independent of UV details. And if you even if you set the macroscopically uh, I mean, large charge limit, you have your quantum corrections with a dominant a contribution to the Bekenstein Hawking part. No, no, my question was different actually. So small black holes are basically their uh, classical event horizon area vanishes. The yes. AH vanishes. AH goes to zero. Okay. So in that case, uh, what would be the structure of the log corrections? Like you know, here you just calculated the Sillet David coefficient A4 and you know you had some formula for the log corrections. Uh, so if for small black holes, how you do proceed for this? Obviously, yeah. this treatment is also is not possible because here, the, the while deriving the central formula, we have considered the last chart limit. Only then we got that. Actually, I don't have any good answer for that. OK. Thank you, uh, Sudeep, for your nice talk. Let's move on to the third talk of this session. Speaker is Mohammad Sabir. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, you are audible. Uh, time is 15 minutes, so 12 minutes talk and 33 minutes for discussion, please. Okay. So can I share my screen now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I'm having a time to show my this uh, 
zoom picture to hide this. Muhammad, you are visible and so is your presentation. You just need to go to yeah, slide one. Yeah, but it's uh, covering my uh, picture here. So the zoom Don't picture worry. is uh, overlapping with the PDF. Uh, it's okay. You are visible. Just go to slide one and start. Okay. So actually, I might not, might not be able to look through my own slides. <laughs> so oh. I have to make it go away. There would be a minimize screen option besides your image. Yeah. So yeah, so my talk is about the uh, when black holes demands a new Lie algebra. So as you can see, my talk is going to be parallel both in physics and maths. So I have to describe both of them and uh, it's gonna be hard for me to squeeze through a 15 minute window, but I'll try my best. So let's start. So more of the story is here. So the first of my plans, so I'll start with the moral story, then I describe the physics side of story. Then the math side story, they should have been the math side of story. story. And uh, the marriage of the two sides, then we describe our work and some results from there, like the model of forms. So, so uh, our work like falls in the category where we uh, suggest some uh, new insights in math. And in the following uh, flow chart, we can uh, debrief in a little bit here. So for physics side, we talk about quarter BBS black holes in natural force and school force symmetry. And uh, where we are interested in CHL models based on uh, Z and all B folds. So there are two ingredients, the partition function and walls of margin stability. While on the other hand side, other hand, uh, math uh, uh, point of view. So we talk about big M super algebras and beyond. So this is the work where we uh, we are trying to find out things. And uh, this uh, means uh, there will be like a watching extension of some rank three hyperbole real algebras uh, for n equal to one, two, three, and four, and some more general extension of phase five, eight, six, where we will be talking about. And there we will find uh, some uh, uh, WKB means wild cards, watches denominator identities, and was of wild chamber and relation between them. So let's start with the physics side of story. So uh, here we start with the underscore four string theory in four dimension means uh, 16 supercharges. So we are, we are interested in CHL models based on these n or b folds and this uh, number of n. So the values of n restricts up to eight uh, due to Mukai because of symbiotic uh, automorphism of orbital, orbital action. So begin with the heterodic string theory on four, it's going to do four torus uh, and uh, two circles, S1, S1 head with period uh, two pi. So take the orbit fold by a ZN group generated by two pi by N shift along uh, S1, also in order and lift left moving to symmetry of uh, T4 cross S1 head uh, counterfactive string. So this render N is equal to symmetry prism, but number of mass is like to multiply change to this number given by uh, 48 by uh, n plus or minus two. So there is a dual picture here. So begin with the type two string theories on uh, K3 S1 cross one head. Take the like orbit fold uh, by uh, ZN group generated by two pi by n, by n shift along with S1 and also in order and symmetry of the internal uh, CFT of K3 uh, preserving its full force super symmetry. So uh, let's uh, focus on when and being a uh, prime number, uh, one, two, three, five, seven. 
So though the result had, has been also generalized uh, for and being composite. So the number of even gauge fields in these theories is uh, PN plus six, the states are characterized by electric magnetic uh, charge vectors, Q and QM of the mention PN plus six. So we have here model, model I fields. There are uh, six and plus two of them, a scalar field in a sort of four string theories and set of matrix uh, value is scalar fields um, uh, satisfying uh, these relation where L being the signature matrix of this size. And there are also an extreme relative field, lambda. So let's talk about the dual symmetry. So P duality, uh, each of uh, charge vector Q and QM constants under a T duality group, uh, uh, this group, which preserves the charge lattice, which is an even self one lattice of signature L. And the T duality, T duality inter invariants are here, these guys. And let's talk about S duality. So a dynamic charge uh, vector uh, Q and QM in this story and S modulus X relative field lambda both transform under congruent subgroup of SL2Z such that these uh, A, B, C, D belongs to a gamma one type congruent subgroup. And now the walls of margin stability. So far away from the black hole, the vacuum is parameterized by arbitrary values of these modeloid fields. M infinity and lambda infinity. So wherever infinity shows means we are far away from the black holes. <clears throat> so as we move in this asymptotic moduli space, we encounter a co-dimension one sort of space uh, called uh, also margin stability. So a quarter BPS state can decay into two half uh, BPS states as one moves across the wall of margin stability. So here we get the uh, equation of circle, which represents the, these arcs in the upper half plane. Where uh, E depends on all the model life fields, A, B, C, D, and charge. It does not depend on the lambda infinity. So the, the arc intersect the real lambda infinity axis at P over C and V over D for a given E. When uh, E squared is zero, the arcs are semi circles centered on the real lambda infinity axis with radius one over two CD. So when either uh, of C or D are zero, the circles become straight lines. And include the real axis for is zero. So these are some examples for n is equal to one, two, and three. And for n more greater than three, there are some like infinity arcs reaching up to limiting points. So now we count the PBS states. So in these theories, the number of uh, microscopic quantum states for black hole is determined by degeneracy of quarter PBS states. So quarter PBS states are generated by the genus to Siegel model forms. Uh, phi kn, where k depends on n, and k is also the weight of level n subgroup of sp2z n, sp2z. So one has uh, this relation, yeah, the generating function for the degeneracies, where uh, z belongs to Siegel upper half space of genus 2, where z the Siegel upper half plane is defined by these relations. So z belongs to complex numbers, and uh, tau and omega are the upper half plane numbers and this relation is there. And we are making following identifications. And uh, the triplet NLM is simply defined by these numbers. And this greater than zero means uh, this conditions follow. Where the weight function for uh, prime values is given by this, and this has been shown in work of uh, De Graaf for Linde Brothers, Jart Krensey. While for the composite value of n for four and six, this has been shown by uh, Suresh Kohan Rajan and his uh, former students. So now we discuss about the math type of story. So here we talk about the SL2Z, which is like mother of all real, real algebras, and uh, we complexify it. And we have the generators in terms of uh, Pauli's matrices. They have their relations. Now we take multiple copies of SL2Z and try to construct, construct a new real algebra uh, with these uh, following relations, called Chevalier relations. So here, uh, any AIG can be taken as an element of the matrix, which we call in general Cartan matrix. So uh, algebra. G tilde is spanned by multiple commutators. 
So as you can see, there is no upper limit for this size of these commutators. So far, there is no relation among EI and FI. So this uh, doesn't truncate the size. So, but we got a theorem due to cars that uh, there always exists a unique maximal subalgebra uh, I, which has a Lie brackets closed with G tilde. This means we can always question out I from G tilde. So we get a small Lie algebra, may not be the finite always, but we get a small Lie algebra. And uh, putting the generators of I equal to zero gives you, gives you the set relation. So now we classify our uh, uh, Lie algebra into uh, Kasmuth Lie algebra. So, so the algebra G uh, may be G A uh, may be finite or infinite dimensional depends on the off diagonal entries of the Kasmuth matrix. So if we restrict off diagonal entries of matrix A to be non-positive integers only, the algebra G is said to be Kasmuth algebra. So here you, see, you can see the following chart. So we are interested in these three cases: the finite dimensional, the fine, and hyperbolic cases. So when the determinant, when the matrix A is non-singular, we always got finite, finite dimensional. Otherwise, there is an infinite dimensional algebra. And if the eigenvalue is zero, we get a fine. And uh, there is a special case for other, that uh, if the signature of the matrix is uh, Lorentzian type, so we also may get the hyperbolic algebra. If removing one, if any one of the uh, row or column of same index, we'll get you the finite or am I a fine. So now we come to the Borchers uh, uh, Lie algebra. So by allowing the diagonal entries uh, AII of matrix A, not just two, but also non-positive real numbers, we get a bigger class of Lie algebra called Borchers class of Lie algebra. Now we can associate to every Lie algebra a root lattice, a lattice Q of rank R equipped with a bilinear form. For finite case, it is just a killing form. So it's called the root lattice of uh, algebra G. If it has a basis like alpha one of alpha, so that the gram matrix introduced by alpha i represents the Cartan matrix uh, such that in this form. So now the while group. So if uh, the pairing between alpha i is, is two, then alpha i also called the real simple rules. The reflection of any uh, lambda, any vector from, belongs to Q with respect to real simple rules, alpha i uh, is given by uh, lambda minus the twice of the component in that direction, or simply this formula called a simple reflection, and uh, a group uh, uh, generated by all the simple reflections is called the while group. Uh, sorry. So now roots. So any elements of uh, the wild orbit of uh, real simple roots. So when it's exhausted by all the by the uh, wild orbit, every simple roots give the full sets of two. And for every root alpha, there is a minus alpha also also a root. And alpha not being alpha is equal to zero, not being a root means we can always uh, partition into two disjoint sets. So one is called the positive roots and the other one is the negative roots. And further, we can decompose the Lie algebra into triangular way. And uh, dimension of these, these all of all these uh, G alpha is called the multiplicity of alpha. So now we define the uh, wild denominator formula for this guy. So this is the product side, this is the sum side, where uh, rho is the wild vector defined by this guy and gives the same goes convention. So for example, let's start with SU3. So Cartan matrix is given by these guys. And uh, we have, let's say alpha one, alpha two are the simple rules. So we have the wild group, which is exactly the S3 symmetry group and full set of roots are given by these. We have the root multiple series, multi uh, every roots have multiplicity one here. And uh, we get the denominator formula here like this. And uh, when determinant is uh, singular, means uh, fine, we have a finite algebra. So we talk about the SU2 case, where uh, Cartan matrix is given by these, and these are the simple roots, and these uh, wild group, the full set of roots, and we also have a non uh, imaginary root, which given by which have non zero, and uh, here also the root multiplicity are one. 
So, so by identifying these uh, values with the uh, Q and R, we get the product side is this form, and here here is the sum side. So this gives you the famous uh, Jacobi triple proletarian. And if we extended our uh, 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 formula for uh, extent for watched scales, we got an extra convection term T here. And which depends on the pairwise orthogonal simple images. So let's talk about the, an example here. So we don't have time. You can yes. take one minute to wind up. So let me skip these uh, guys here. So we can show an example for uh, how T correction term here. Uh, please show and your results, please. Skip all these things, get your results. Okay. The last, uh, I mean, on the. So let's talk about the. Value and model forms. forms, that's all. Go to that. Okay. I'm still having the overlap of my Zoom over my slides. It's hard for me. Can someone help me through here? It says partition function, slide number I can't see. But okay, so. Marriage of this insights. You're coming to embedding. Keep going, keep going. So, okay, so here we talk about the partition function. So, Caesar model forms uh, the square roots of yn. Are, uh, we talk about the square roots of phi n here, which have integral Fourier coefficients up to n to the six, and up to n to the four for each one of them has found to be the product set of a WKB denominator formula of some water extension of a and algebra, respectively. And uh, this part shouldn't be here. And uh, for uh, uh, delta KN corresponding to different order of coining is still some watches extension of AN, except the correction term T is different now. The multiplicative seed for these uh, four singular models are of weight zero Jacobi forms, size one, which are the elliptic genera of Calabia manifolds for these two, three, four, and eight, respectively. The Jacobi forms are associated with pure ANEMR root system in their uh, AD classification, and there we get an other weight zero Jacobi forms. Psi 0, 6 that can be associated to n is 6 case. And the walls of margin 50, the walls of margin stability for n is 1, 2, 3 are literally the walls of wild chambers associated to the BKMD algebra, AN. We also have the walls of uh, wild chambers associated to A, A5 and A6. And a no go theorem due to Grisenko and Nikon says only an algebra more general than BKM may relate to the partition functions for n is 5, 6. As the denominator formula, this is the work we are trying to do, and that uh, generalized version of Lie algebra. So our side of the story. So we're trying to decompose problem into the we know the into into those matrix. There is a diagonal blocks of uh, SL2 Lie algebras. So we're trying to decompose this problem into the characters of SL2 heads, since the characters of Lie algebra remain invariant under SL seated wild group, we may try to decompose uh, these uh, singular model forms in terms of the characters of to head. So like here we can, so here's the Fourier Jacobi expansion uh, for this guy. As you can see, this is the multiplicative seed for this guy. So the character is defined in this way, and where theta KLs are the generalized theta function we decompose psi 0n for n equal to 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, and 6, like this. And we computed g1 tau and g2 tau and others uh, as a Q series. For example, here you can see these, we got them up to pretty much high orders. And uh, x, uh, for uh, psi 0, 4, there's a special case. We got constants instead of Q series. And there are other decompositions like this. So on the way to the finding new algebra, we ended up finding some nice examples of uh, vector valued model forms. So these G1s 
G to N. Sorry, oh. <coughs> sorry, Shubhriya. Uh, may I uh, humbly request uh, that one may keep track of the time, please? Yes. 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 Time so is we have these vector model forms. They fit through nice so we, the definition given by Beck and uh, yes. So these are the results and some, uh, this is summary. We study single model forms that are constructive from Jacobi forms as the wild cast botches uh, denote formulas. We first show that all the super algebra admits are said to have sub -algebras. We then study the composition of single model forms in terms of the self character. The first non trivial terms lead to the decomposition of the umbral Jacobi forms in terms of the self characters. This decomposition provides a vector valued model of forms for each case. We obtain closed formulas for all these vector valued model of forms in particular. We show that all but one of them are sufficient to the model matrix differential equation studied by Gannon. These formulae provide the multiplicity of real imaginary simple groups on the real algebra and the future direction. So our next goal is to obtain a central decomposition for full signal model forms. And also we have started to look into signal model form for the CHL order forms. Thank you. Thank you, Sabir. I think we are running short of time. Maybe one question, you can short question. Okay, we'll move on to the next talk. Thank you, Sabir. Okay, thanks. Next speaker is Madhu Misra. Hello. Yes, you are audible. Okay, so is my screen visible? Yes. Okay. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am genuinely grateful for having the opportunity to present my work here. The topic I will be topic, uh, to talking about is higher derivative action in n is equal to 2 supergravity, which will be based on this work that I did with Pindusar. A little disclaimer because of time constraint, I have kept the talk very non technical. Uh, so, okay, so this is an outline of my talk. I'll start with motivation, where I'll talk about what inspired me to study the higher derivative actions in supergravity. Following with the formalism required, results we obtained and its significance. And I will end, my, uh, end by mentioning some of the future work. All right, so our starting point and motivation was black holes because of its key property that they have an entropy. In 60s and 70s, Bekenstein and Hawking uh, wrote down this very pioneering formula for the entropy of black hole, which is given as follows. As you notice, this formula has all the universal constants. So it can describe gravity, relativity, quantum mechanics, and statistical physics, which is extremely interesting. Now, the natural question one asks is, could we give Boltzmann interpretation to this entropy? Can we write black hole entropy in terms of microstates of black holes? Well, it turns out for ex uh, asymptotically flat extremal black holes, we can. And that's what Strominger and Waffa did in 1996. They calculated black hole entropy in string theory by realizing black hole as a brain system. Their result agreed with Bakkenstein and Hawking and uh, results, and it also provided subleading corrections to the entropy. Note, although the leading term of entropy is universal, the coefficient alpha and beta appearing in the subleading correction will depend on a given theory. However, due to lack of experimental evidence for string theory, one relies on some theoretical tests to verify the mathematical consistency of string theory. And supergravity theory, being the low energy limit of string theory, can provide such consistency checks. And this is where high derivative terms in supergravity comes into the picture. So higher derivative terms in supergravity can provide a subleading correction to the black hole entropy and matching of macroscopic entropy computed in supergravity with the microscopic entropy calculated in string theory can give us the mathematical consistency check for string theory that we were looking for. Other than that, ADS safety correspondence also provides strong incentives to study high derivative terms in gay supergravity theory. Uh, now I would like to lay out some of the terminology that I will be using going forward in this talk. So multiplet is nothing but the set of fields that transform among each other under supersymmetry. While multiplet is a multiplet in superconformal theory that contains gauge fields like gravitini and graviton. Meta multiplet uh, is a multiplet with highest spin less than or equal to uh, one. For example, chiral multiplet, vector multiplet, or hyper multiplet. They're also known as compensating multiplets. 
and the reason for it will be clear uh, later on this talk and density formula in conformal supergravity are conformally super conformally invariant action given either in terms of an abstract multiplet or in terms of known multiplet such as vector multiplet or chiral multiplet all right uh, so now that we are uh, familiar with the important nomenclature i would talk about very famous formalism which is used to construct hard derivative action in supergravity theory the uh, the super conformal tensor calculus uh, so it is based on gauge equivalence program where one start with extra symmetries and finally construct the theory with a lower group of symmetries and it is useful to construct off shell point carry supergravity theory okay so this is an uh, this is the flow chart that describes the gauge equivalence program uh, i'm really sorry if the text are not visible clearly but bear with me i will try to explain each of them one by one so uh, first we will discuss till this point so first uh, first step is to construct a gauge theory for super conformal theory and for that we will assign gauge field to each generator so these are seven generators of super conformal theory and these are corresponding generators and these are corresponding parameters uh, now to make this theory a theory of gravity we need to identify local translation with general coordinate transformation and that will require us to impose some constraint on the curvature and due to these constraints uh, some of the gauge fields get dependent and these are the gauge field that get dependent and now if you calculate the optional degrees of freedom of independent gauge field they will not match thus we will need to add extra fields to make sure the optional degrees of freedom matches and these extra uh, fields along with the independent gauge field will form a while multiplet and it turns out in four five and six dimensions there are two inequivalent choices for the auxiliary field giving rise to two inequivalent while multiplet commonly known as standard while multiplet and dilton while multiplet a uh, one can work with either of the while multiplet all right so now we will go back to this uh, flow chart so i've described till this point once we choose uh, which while multiplet we work with uh, we will couple it with appropriate meta multiplet also known as compensating multiplet because it compensate for the extra symmetries we have introduced in the theory finally we will embed it into a density formula to construct the invariant action in super conformal theory now the gauge fix extra symmetry we will of and carry action all right so now that we are familiar with uh, super conformal tensor calculus method uh, i am going to list down some of the results Uh, already known results so uh, uh, there are various uh, known density formula in n, n is equal to 2 super gravity in four dimensions for example carrel density formula tensor vector density formula and another density formula which was constructed using some abstract multiplet there are two types of while multiplet in four dimension although the standard while multiplet was known uh, in four dimensions since long time The Dilton while multiplet was constructed in 2017 by Bindu Sar and his collaborators, uh, and there are various uh, higher derivative action has been constructed in n is equal to two super gravity using standard while multiplet multiplet. For example, in 1981, these authors constructed while tensor square action. In 2013, these authors uh, constructed Ricci tensor square, a combination of Ricci tensor square. and ricci scalar square action built out of non linear spiral multiplet and in 2015 ricci scalar square action was constructed by these authors now that i have given uh, now here i have given uh, given a field content of standard uh, while multiplet and dilton while multiplet where in red i have denoted, uh, denoted the independent gauge field and in blue over here are the auxiliary field unlike previous work we chose to work with dilton while multiplet for our construction of higher derivative action in n is equal to 2 super gravity in four dimensions and here are few advantages of using dilton while multiplet one of the advantages of using dilton while multiplet is that only one compensating multiplet is required uh, uh, to go from super conformal theory to super point carry theory whereas uh, standard while multiplet needs two compensating multiplet Another advantage of using Dilton while multiplet is that it has in inbuilt two-form field, which is not present in standard while multiplet. 
and any high derivative action that would come from the construction that might come from the compactification of string theory should have a two form field while the dilaton while multiplet has a two form inbuilt inbuilt in it uh, the two form field in construction involving standard while multiplet must come from some another uh, meta multiplet other than that uh, other than that the reason we chose to work with dilaton while multiplet is the existence of map between young mills multiplet and dilaton while multiplet in point carre theory so in this work uh, we reported the construction of arbitrary curvature squared action coupled to arbitrary number of vector while vector multiplet using dilaton while multiplet we found a map between uh, dilaton while multiplet and young mills multiplet in point carre theory and we used uh, this map to construct the uh, riemann square invariant action Uh, the complete action was encoded in a single holomorphic pre potential g where this x is a complex scalar of vector multiplet this b a and c are composite fields constructed out of different fields of meta multiplet now the pre potential can be ex uh, expanded as follows where g is equal to 0 g is equal to this small g is equal to 0 will describe the minimal part of the lagrangian and this small g greater than or equal to 1 will give us the series of interaction terms which are quadratic in curvature with field dependent coupling hence by appropriately choosing the pre potential g for a, for instance if we chose uh, if we choose g is equal to 1 we will get a purely curvature square terms in the action and by appropriately tuning this uh, coefficient alpha beta and gamma we can write down a arbitrary curvature square term coupled to arbitrary uh, hol holomorphic sorry uh, holomorphic uh, function of vector multiplet okay for the significance of our result so one can use this result to test the non renormalization theorem and we can use this uh, action to investigate the ads for black holes and holography principle in n is equal to 2 gay supergravity constructed out of dilaton while multiplet for future work and these are some ongoing work as well so we have in, in recent this paper we have constructed n is equal to 3 conformal supergravity action now in current uh, currently we have uh, we have obtained vector multiplet and we are trying to couple it with conformal supergravity action to obtain a n is equal to 3 point carre supergravity action other than that we are also working on this uh, subleading corrections to the entropy of asymptotically flat black holes in n is equal to 4 supergravity theories and with amita we are looking at thermodynamics of near bps black hole in ads six uh, these are some other areas of interest so i'm interested in double copy construction fluid gravity correspondence and supersymmetry anomalies uh, thank you so now now i can take questions thank you modu we can take up one or two short questions right uh yeah madhu can i ask something here yeah yeah sure yeah so for uh, alpha beta gamma for all these three parameters you have a supersymmetrized uh, uh, action is that uh, correct is is this yes. you said yes yes yeah so these alpha beta gamma right yeah yeah yes And yeah And the alpha, beta, gamma can be different for different values of g, right? I mean, it's just symbol there, right? Or yes. Write. So they are. The, so basically, what I mean is, if you put, uh, like, you if you want this Riemann tensor square, you can put beta and gamma to zero, and you'll just be, you'll just have this Riemann square action. But that will come from some particular term, right? Which is g. Yes. Yes. Right? so uh, yes yeah so this riemann will come from this curly a uh, because there is this alpha coming so this all the terms which are coming with this curly a will give me something which is proportional to riemann tensor square action oh you mean all powers of a will give will all contribute to riemann or a square or a so a is equal to 1 so this small g, g. g is equal to 1 g is equal to 1 will give me riemann Square. If we take g is equal to two, this Riemann square will be uh, will have something uh, multiplied with it, some other curvature term multiplied with it. So it will be a higher derivative, right? So yeah. yes, it okay. will be higher derivative. For example, uh, in our Lagrangian, we have worked till g is equal to two. So we we have terms like uh, Maxwell field multiplied with this curvature square. So it's higher derivative term. Okay. More than four derivative, I mean. Okay. 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Madhu. We'll move on to the last talk of this session. Speaker is Traksu Sarma. The title is Scattering Ideas. Hello, uh, am I audible? Yes. Uh, can you see the screen, uh, the slides? Yes. yes. Your your time is for thirty. It talk should be for thirteen minutes and two minutes for discussion. Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity uh, to present my work on scattering in anti-dissider space-time. Uh, uh, this work is done in collaboration with Professor Abhijit Gade and will be out on archive hopefully in a couple of weeks. Uh, the work is mostly focused on simplifying the Witten diagrams competition. As you know that Witten diagrams are usually computed in position space, which is a difficult task, especially for more than one loops. Similar difficulty also arises in computing the flat space Feynman diagrams in position space. But the existence of translation symmetry in flat space makes the computations of Feynman diagrams much simpler in momentum space. This motivates one to define the momentum-like variables in ADS. But there is no translation symmetry in ADS. So what do we mean by momentum in ADS? In order to answer this, consider this ADS d comma one cylinder of ADS length R. The QIs are the boundary points and C is a bulk point. We approximate a region in ADS as flat space. We choose this region to be around point C as uh, this gray uh, region shown in the figure. This region is of order one, which is much smaller than the ADS length R. The momentum in ADS are the local momentum PIs that are defined in this small region. We will show later that uh, these momentum PIs and the boundary points QIs are related to each other by Fourier transform that is defined just on the boundary. Uh, in this, uh, the expectation is that in this limit, the ADS Witten diagrams in a momentum space uh, will reduce to the flat space scattering amplitude plus some one over R corrections. Uh, now let us understand this uh, flat space limit in more detail. Uh, this uh, the diagram shows two possible scenarios for the exchange Witten diagram. In figure A, uh, the exchange occurs in the small elevator of order one, uh, which is much smaller than the ADS length R. While in figure B, the exchange occurs over an, over an order R distance in the bulk. Depending upon the external point configurations, uh, one will dominate over the other. Now for the flat space approximation to work, the dynamical process, scattering process needs to happen in small elevator in the bulk as shown in figure A. But if the configuration B dominates over the configuration A, then the flat space limit is not relevant. However, there exists a kinematic regime in the cross ratio space where A dominates over B. And we can work in the flat space limit if we restrict ourselves to that particular kinematic regime. This point was shown by Komatsu, Paulus, Sri and Zhao in their 2020 paper on Landau diagrams in ADS. In this slide, uh, we'll discuss the definition of ADS as metric. In the flat space limit of ADS, the Witten diagrams in momentum space, that is G tilde of PI, is proportional to the overall momentum conserving delta function plus some one over R corrections. Uh, the proportionality constant S00 is simply just the flat space S matrix. But at the subleading orders, the translation symmetry is broken because the ADS curvature starts contributing. Therefore, the correction should not be proportional to this uh, momentum conserving delta function. And indeed, they are not. Still, the corrections are tractable in one over our perturbation theory. Thematically, the subleading corrections are shown here. Note that apart from, uh, apart from uh, containing the terms that are proportional to the delta function, they also contain terms that are proportional to various derivatives. For example, up to third order derivative at order one over R square and up to six order derivative at order one over R square and so on. Now we define the ADSS matrix to be the terms that are proportional to just the delta function piece of this full momentum space correlator. Uh, as shown here, we have just uh, collected the 
blue colored terms uh, that is the terms that are proportional to this delta function in order to define the ADSS matrix as zero. Now it may seem that we are losing a lot of information by neglecting the, these terms that are proportional to the derivatives of this delta function. But it turns out that these, uh, these terms can be derived from the ADSS matrix using the conformal ward identities. Uh, an alternative uh, and common, uh, commonly used approach to define, uh, to compute the ADS written diagrams uh, has been derived in the Mellin space. Uh, the ADS S matrix defined above can be used to compute this Mellin amplitude in one over our perturbation theory. At R equals to infinity limit, that is the flat space limit of ADS, uh, one has a very simple looking dictionary between these two as shown here where the Mellon variables S tilde and T tilde are related to the Mendelssohn variables S and T by these relations. Again, this point was, uh, this dictionary has been shown by Komatsu, Polar, Sis, and Zhao in their same 2020 paper on lambda diagrams in ADS. We have extended this dictionary order by order in one over our perturbation theory, and schematically the dictionary is shown here. The, uh, the subleading order correction that order one over R with the Mellon amplitude, that is M1, is it related to the leading order S matrix, that is the flat space S matrix S00 by this first line. Uh, it involves uh, up to second order derivative of this leading order S matrix. The next subleading order correction to the Mellon amplitude at order one over R square, that is M2, is it related to both the leading order S matrix and the subleading order S matrix, that is S00 and S20 by this relation. And it involves up to second, uh, up to fourth order derivative of S00. Uh, so this means that given the leading order S matrix or the flat space S matrix S0, one can fix both the leading and the subleading order Mellon amplitude that is M0 and M1. While in order to know the M2 and M3, one is to know both uh, the leading and the subleading order S matrix that is S00 and, and S20. Uh, now in this slide, we will expl uh, explain the mental space written diagrams in more detail. We will work in the ADS, uh, Lorenzian ADS, that is ADS D comma one, uh, which can be thought of as being embedded in R D comma two. The uh, metric for this embedding space is diagonal with this following signature. The signature is minus one for the zeroth and D plus first component and plus one for the one to D components. The boundary points QI, Qs in these, uh, in, this, in these embedding coordinates Follow the null uh, lie on the null cone q dot q equals to zero and q's and lambda q's are identified. Uh, also, the uh, the point c around which the elevator is chosen uh, has the coordinates zero 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 comma r in this embedding space. Now let us see what these diagrams represent. The left hand side of this diagram represents a, a generic four point Witten diagram in position space. As mentioned earlier, we'll work in the configuration where most of the contribution will come by integrating out the bulk points in this small elevator as shown as, shown as this gray shaded region uh, in this figure. Now, in the momentum space, the expectation is that uh, uh, these momentum variables PIs that are conjugate to the position, boundary position QIs, to behave like the on-shell uh, on -shell local momenta entering this uh, small elevator. So this is achieved by defining the Fourier uh, boundary Fourier transform as shown here, where the PIs and QIs are in the embedding space. Uh, the uh, the uh, factor e to the i p dot QI uh, is a, uh, is a uh, usual Fourier like kernel, and the QIs are integrated over the null point Q, QI dot QI equals to zero. Now, since the uh, since this uh, position space correlator g of qi is a homogeneous function of qis and qi dot qi is zero, this implies the momentum space correlator g tilde of pi is naturally defined on the on-shell uh, momenta pi's. Uh, this means uh, that is the uh, the uh, b plus two components of the momenta p are fixed. In, uh, are uh, fixed in terms of just the D components of this uh, momenta P. Uh, we choose PD plus one to be zero and the rest are constrained to satisfy the on shell condition as shown here. So this choice results into two, two things. First, the momenta P is becomes tangent to the ADS at point delta C. Uh, that is P dot C is zero. 
this can be clearly seen from the choice of uh, uh, point C and the choice of the momenta PIs. Second, uh, the boundary to bulk propagator at point delta C becomes the plane waves uh, entering the elevator at point delta C, that is e to the i p dot delta C. Uh, so this point delta C is taken at order one distance away from this point C, that is inside this elevator. Hence, uh, our definition of uh, uh, momentum space for uh, momentum space propagators, along with the choice of point C and the choice of the uh, these momenta PIs, provides a nice uh, physical scattering in the bulk-like picture for the uh, momentum space written diagrams. Uh, now, in order to compute the momentum space written diagrams or the ADSS matrix efficiently in one over our perturbation theory, we have developed a set of Feynman-like rules. These set of rules have the property that they reduce to the ordinary Feynman rules in the flat space limit, that is in R going to infinity limit. As an illustration, consider an S-channel scalar exchange diagram of mass Me to be the mass of the exchange particle and mass of the uh, uh, external particles to be M. Uh, here, lambda is the cubic coupling constant. The, uh, the ADSS matrix for this exchange diagram is shown here. As expected, the, uh, at the leading order, it is just equal to the flat space S matrix. And the uh, subleading order corrections are shown here. We have also computed smell and amplitude up to order one over R square using our dictionary. Remarkably, the answer agrees with the known result. So now let me uh, conclude quickly uh, what we have discussed so far. So we have, uh, uh, we have defined a momentum space Witten diagrams as the boundary Fourier transform of the position space Witten diagrams. These ADS momenta have the property that they become the ordinary momenta in the flat space limit of ADS. Next, we have defined the uh, ADS S matrix to be the terms that are proportional to just the momentum conserving delta function in the full momentum space correlator. These ADS, this ADS S matrix contains the full information of the momentum space correlator and uh, it reduced to the flat space S matrix in R going to infinity limit. Uh, we have also developed Feynman-like rules for com computing the ADSS matrix in one over R perturbation theory. And finally, we have uh, constructed a one-to-one -one dictionary between ADSS matrix and the Mellon amplitude in one over R perturbation theory. Thank you. Thank you, Traksu. Question? Hi, I had a quick question. So this Feynman-like rules you mentioned, uh, could you say a few more words about them? I mean, is it uh, uniquely determined in some way? I mean, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so uh, in uh, consider that in the ordinary Feynman-like rules, we have at each vertex, we have the conservation of momenta and the momentum is conserved along each propagator also, right? But uh, because of this uh, tra uh, translation symmetry is broken in ADS, we don't have these properties. But still, we can do something uh, uh, like uh, so. These propagators will be a, a function of x uh, in general. I mean, uh, instead of just e to the i p dot x, it will uh, it contains also the uh, multiplication. It is also multiplied with some function of x. So we can think of that function to be a derivative acting on some. Uh, we can insert first of all in insert a moment, uh, insert a local momenta on these propagators, that is a uh, Q with e to die Q dot X and uh, doing the derivative with respect to Q will give us X uh, in the, in the, as a factor. So now we can, uh, uh, we can think of that e to die P dot X plus Q dot X to be, to be our propagator and apply the same Feynman like uh, rules and then then apply this derivative uh, uh, function, function, derivative operators to get the uh, final answer. Is, is it clear? Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe you can take one more question. Yeah, can, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, so is it special to like what you are doing? Is it special to anti desitter or can I also do the similar thing in desitter? Uh, I think we can we can do the similar thing to Desitter also, but uh, the uh, the here the, like we have uh, we have this uh, Mellin uh, related these correlators to the Mellin amplitude right uh, and 
uh, I'm not sure how to do that uh, in the DCTR. In DCTR, in the boundary, you know, there's a this uh, very nice correspondence between, you know, in the uh, DCTR uh, using Witten diagram, what you calculate is precisely the same as a CFT correlator in momentum space. You know, you, you can do the momentum space thing there. Uh, yes. Maldas and Apimental work. So, yes. uh, uh, so there also people do talk about this flexus limit. I, I was just wondering from that perspective. Yeah, I think I think we can do this in this iterator, and uh, like we are thinking towards that direction only, uh, but we, uh, we are not yet uh, there. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Traksu. And uh, let me thank all the five speakers of this session. And, uh, Alok, now you please take. Yeah. Right. Uh, thank you, Shubhriya. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, so. Uh, we are doing better than yesterday. So we're going to be having 50 minutes worth of lunch time. So uh, with the, okay, so let's reconvene at 2.15, 2 15 2 15 minutes, uh, and I think Bobby is here, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Right. So is that fine, Bobby? Yeah, it's fine with me. So, uh, okay. So uh, we are going to reconvene with Bobby as the chair of the first, uh, post lunch session. All right. So see you soon. Two fifteen, please. Thank you. So team, I think uh, we can end the recordings and uh, then the meeting.